please be seated. The Board of Inquiry into the Hainsworth Mine Fire is now in session. Morning. Uh, as indicated uh, at um, conclusion of yesterday's evidence, this morning we'll be hearing from uh, the work cover witnesses to complete the, the last part of the regulatory puzzle. Um, before I call the first of those witnesses, I just want to um, just do a little bit of housekeeping and, and tidying up some of the documentation that will be referred to today and tomorrow. Uh, really for the benefit of the party so that it's it's clear what's in and, and what what's in evidence and, and what is not. Um, firstly, uh, uh, just a brief explanation for the, uh, the position with the work cover witnesses. Initially, the board sought from uh, work cover one or more witness statements dealing with a range of, of topics in a letter dated the 6th of May 2014. Broadly speaking, the topics were regulation of the mine, firefighter safety and advice that was provided to uh, employers in Morwell during the fire. Initially, the uh, board was notified that a Mr Len Neist, a senior officer at work cover, would be the appropriate witness to deal with those three topics. Uh, the board had a, um, uh, an informal meeting with Mr. Neist and also uh, legal representatives for work cover on the 14th of May. And it became clear that whilst Mr. Neist could deal with some of the subject matters, there were, it was thought there'd be other witnesses who would be more appropriate dealing with those. So a further letter was sent and ultimately four statements from four different witnesses were provided to the inquiry. Um, they, those statements, uh, statements from Mr. Neist himself uh, Mr Kelly, who gave evidence in week one on the topic of firefighter safety. Uh, Mr Hayes, who is a local inspector, who will be called this morning. And finally, Mr Adam Watson, who dealt with the discreet question of whether or not uh, work cover was conducting an investigation into the fire and what the scope of that investigation is. What I propose to do is uh, tender the statement of Mr Watson now. I think it should be, fair enough. It's not intended to call Mr Watson unless council assisting receives some indication from a party that, um, that a different course ought to be followed. And uh, the other thing I'd like to do as the witnesses today and particularly the expert witnesses tomorrow and Friday are likely to be asked to look at a number of documents in evidence that have been provided to them. Some of those documents are already in evidence, but a number are not. And what we've done is we've put together a folder of, doc of 10 documents uh, which have been provided to both Professor Cliff and Mr Incol and are referred to in their expert reports. And uh, I would ask that that folder of those 10 documents, and I have a list here um, which we can provide to the parties. Uh, they're all documents that were provided to the inquiry by GDF Sewers, and there are folders being provided to the parties now. So I would ask that that folder be marked uh, as a separate Exhibit 66. As I've indicated, the documents were provided to the inquiry um, by solicitors acting on behalf of GDF Sewers under cover of a letter dated the 2nd of May 2014. Um, I think for completeness, I should tender that letter as part of that exhibit. And uh, with those housekeeping matters dealt with, I call uh, Mr Kevin Hayes. Please raise the Bible and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God, 
I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. To this board of inquiry. To this board of inquiry. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Morning, Mr. Hayes. Um, for purposes of the transcript, can you please state your uh, full name and your professional address? Kevin Shepherd Hayes. Mr. Hayes, uh, for the purposes of this inquiry, um, have you made a statement dated the 27th of May 2014? I have. And you have a copy of that statement in front of you? I do. And uh, it's a statement of uh, six numbered paragraphs with a, uh, a number of preliminary paragraphs that are not numbered, is that right? That's correct. And uh, there are many attachments um, attached to your statement. Have you had an opportunity to read through the statement before coming along this morning? I have. And uh, is there anything that you'd like to change in the statement? No. I'll tender the statement. Now, Mr Hayes, uh, in response to an inquiry from uh, an inquiry from the solicitor to the inquiry, a further document has been produced. Um, rather than asking you to identify that now, I'll perhaps deal with that at the appropriate time in the course of, of your evidence, if that's acceptable to you. Okay. All right, we'll do that. Now, um, you are employed as a uh, field subject matter expert workplace inspector at work cover. Can you tell us what a field subject matter expert is? Field subject matter expert is more a classification within the uh, employment structure within WorkSafe. Um, I am employed as an inspector yes. and I believe the classification is actually a technical inspector within those boundaries. Okay, yeah. so you're an inspector appointed under the Occupational Health and Safety Act 2004? That is correct. That's a statutory position That's that correct. you yeah. hold. Um, internally, you hold a classification, mm -hmm. uh, I think you've told us, a technical inspector. Mm -hmm. Is it not, not field subject matter inspector? Is there a difference between those two? The FSME, I believe, is, is the classification, so I'll clear that up. That okay. is the classification. Well, I think it obviously is some pace based on pay rates and things like that. Right. We won't. We won't. No, we'll... it's... I, I look... Yeah, there is, there isn't a delineation, I don't believe you. Okay, I won't interrogate you about pay rates, you'll be happy to know. Um, but it's the subject matter that I'm, I'm okay. interested in. Yeah. What, which, what is the subject matter that you hold expertise? Is it mining or is it more, is it, is it more narrow than that? Or what, what is it precisely? Um, look, I'm an electrician, originally. Yes. Um, and we are employed in the Earth Resources Unit to deal with mines, to regulate mines. So. That is the area that we work in predominantly, rather than just the general workplaces that, that exist throughout Victoria. Okay. Now, you're based in the Trelgan Office of Work Cover. That's correct. Is that right? Um, and uh, do, you, do you only work as inspector in the Earth, the Earth Resources Unit, or do you also uh, carry out general inspection functions in other workplaces? Very limited, but from time to time, yes. I will go out to other workplaces other than mines. Um, can we put a percentage of your time estimate on that? Is it 95, 5 per cent? OK, so 95 per cent of your time yeah. is within the Earth Resources That's Unit correct. and you yeah. do some general Yeah, that work. is correct. I understand. Now, you have been a member of the Earth Resources Unit since August 2008, and we know from other evidence before the inquiry that the Earth Resources Unit within Work Cover was established in January 2008? Is that right? That is correct. That was the time when the uh, function of regulating occupational health and safety in mines was transferred from what was then DPI, Department of Primary Industries, to Work Cover. That is correct. Okay. I understand that was before your time, mm. but nonetheless you are engaged at a very early stage of the work that was being done uh, by work cover in this area. That is correct. Um, now, in terms of your personal background and qualifications, you set out your qualifications on page one of your statement towards the bottom of the page, and I won't go through each of them, but um, you have completed the requisite tertiary qualifications 
uh, to work as an inspector appointed under the Occupational Health and Safety Act? I believe so. Yeah. Um, and more specifically, you've got a graduate diploma in hazard and risk management and a certificate for an occupational health and safety. You say you're currently completing a Bachelor of Applied Management. I take it that continues? That's correct. All right. And as you've already told us, um, by way of trade before uh, you were appointed at uh, WorkCover, you're an A-grade electrician. That's correct. Before 2008, you, um, if my maths is right, you spent some 21 years working in a range of capacities in the various open-cut coal mines in the Latrobe Valley. That is correct. <clears throat> you hadn't worked for DPI as part of their uh, regulatory group at all. Is that right? No. No. So. No. We know that um, at least one uh, inspector was transferred across at the time that the function transferred, but that, that obviously is not you. No, definitely not. Um, and uh, the role, the work that you did in the various open-cut coal mines in the Latrobe Valley, um, you've set out at the top of page two of your statement, um, and uh, those roles. Uh, included a safety advising function. Is that right? That's correct. Um, was that only uh, whilst you were employed at the Luoyang mine between 2002 or 2008? Yes, that's correct. Right. Um, prior to that, you had been uh, working in your capacity as, as an electrician at uh, both your lawn and the Luoyang mine. That's correct. Um, I think I said earlier that you'd worked in each of the open cut coal mines. That might have been an overstatement. Have you? Did you ever actually work at Hazelwood no. at any time? No. All right. Just before leaving your um, your qualifications, the qualifications that you have listed. If we can just go back to page one, the second last paragraph of the statement. Um, those qualifications, I think you've already agreed with the proposition, are the ones that um, all inspectors, or all recently appointed inspectors anyway in the last few years that work for work cover uh, are required to obtain. Is that right? I wouldn't agree with that. I don't know whether all inspectors recently have got those qualifications. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. All right. I'm more interested... Um, in exploring with you what specific training you received in relation to your work in the Earth Resources Unit mm -hmm. over and above the general, those general qualifications. Yeah. Can you, um, can you summarise that, what, what other training was provided to you? Other training, um, formal and informal, uh, underground mining, ground control, uh, but very basic type of uh, training and instruction. Yes. So it wasn't a full in-depth qualification that was attained at the end of it. Um, two to three day courses, depending on, on what type of training we're looking at. As I said, underground training, it was, it was a uh, fairly in-depth um, in course. Um, ventilation, but all relating to underground mining, I might add. Yes. Um, in, in terms of open cut or training relevant to open cut mining, traffic management um, and basic as I do risk assessment type, type of training. Um, was uh, any of that training provided to you by uh, people employed by the mine regulator who we now know as DB, DSI, DSI yeah. I think, um, DPI previously? Did you? Uh, no, not to my knowledge, other than the mentoring that I received by uh, Greg Sleziak, who's the other inspector that you were talking about that made that transition across okay. from the DPI. Um, he's referred to in Mr Kelly's statement, that's Sleziak, L-E, sorry, S-L-E-Z-I-A-K. That's correct. That? Um, and does um, does Mr Sleziak continue to work for work no, cover? No, All right. But he was that one person that came across that's correct. Uh, with, with the function. 
And if I understood you correctly, that he played a role in mentoring That's correct. you when you started uh, in August of 2008. That's correct. All right. Um, did he uh, have a, a sort of express supervisory role in relation to your work, or was it more an informal mentoring? Informal. Role? And did you receive any training in relation to uh, fire, the suppression of fire, the um, prevention of fires in open cut coal mines? Has that ever been part of your training? No. Do you know, um, and, and you might not be the right person to ask, but do you know if that's been Addressed is any is is there now any specific training provided to inspectors in the unit in relation to fire and particularly in in open cut mines? Not today, not not as we speak today. No. Okay. You've already told the inquiry that you're based in Turalgan, and uh, we all know that there are three uh, large open cut coal mines. Uh, in the vicinity of, of Tralgan, um, is that where you do uh, all of your work at those at, at, in relation to those three mines, or are you responsible for other mines in Victoria too? The bulk of the work would be within those three mines, but yes, I'm responsible for the regulations in other mines that are in the location. So we're talking at Woods Point, Orbost. And quarries, I might add, as well, are yes. thrown into that mix. So that that in the region, yeah. Okay. So you, you've got Gippsland, essentially. Is that right? Yeah. Mines Gippsland. and quarries. Yeah. Um, but I think you've told us the majority of your focus is on the yeah. three open cut coal mines. Um, and can you tell the inquiry? Would you um, would you visit one of those mines uh, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis or or what on average? On average, it would be maybe one to two times a month. Right. Yeah. Your statement, as, as uh, was requested, deals with your involvement at the Hazelwood Mine, um, essentially from 2009, January 2009, I'm looking at paragraph two of your statement, until March of 2009. And 14. Excuse me, Mr. Rosen, if I could just interrupt. Certainly. Um, Mr. Hayes, could you just clarify, you mentioned that you visit the mines one to two times per month. Do you have a pre-populated um, program that you discuss with the mines, um, or do you just sort of turn up unannounced and ask questions? Can you just tell me about the engagement? Yeah, look, it's, it's a combination of, of all those things. We do have pre-planned what we call priority visits, where we will go out, um, oversight visits. And then, of course, there are um, the occasional incident follow-up, notice follow-ups. So all those visits are included in that one to two times a month, yeah. So in terms of engaging with the site, they don't get a months in advance heads up that in June or July we're going to be coming out and looking at certain aspects. We will suggest to them that, you know, there, there are four or five oversight visits a year. And that's pretty much as, as it is, and we stagger them out through the year. And the pre-planned um, priority visits, are they on particular topics? The oversight visits, yes, they are. Could you just elaborate perhaps on some of the topics you cover? Maintenance, plant stability, batter stability, generally things that relate to major mining hazards, vehicle interaction. Thank you. You referred there um, to major mining hazards and uh, now might be the appropriate time to ask you some questions about that. That's a, a term that's used in uh, part 5.3 of the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations 2007. That is correct. Yep. And uh, those regulations are being brought up on the screen, or at least that part of those regulations. And uh, I just want to ask you some questions about that. No doubt you're very familiar with the provisions of these regulations. I'm familiar, yes. Yeah. Um, 
first thing I want to ask you about is this um, concept of a prescribed mine uh, in Regulation 5.3.3. As I understand it, um, Inspector, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, all mines, as defined, fall under Part 5.3 of the regulations? That's correct. Um, but a, a, a percentage or a proportion of, of that group of mines are prescribed as prescribed mines as under, that under the regulations? That's correct, yeah. yeah. And the prescribing is as we can see from Regulation 5.3, um, uh, covers all underground mines, paragraph A, and also a mine that is determined to be a prescribed mine by the authority under Regulation 5.3.4. That's correct. And Hazelwood, we know, is a prescribed mine, and the reason it's a prescribed mine is because it's been prescribed by the authority under Regulation 5.3.4. Is that right? I believe so, but I believe the authority at that time would have been the DPI that prescribed or that that term in that class of mine. Okay. And it's it's a transition that's that's come across into VWA here. I see. So yeah. as far as you know, there's been no separate um, determination by the authority. It's just continued the previous. Yeah, not by well, not that I am aware of from VWA. It's just a continuation from the, the um, DSDBI or DPI back then. Yeah. Okay. Um, Maybe that you can't then answer the next question, I'll try anyway, and, and uh, if not, we can take it up with Mr Neist. Um, the regulations set out a, a process that is required to be followed by the, by the authority of holding an inquiry before prescribing a mine as a prescribed mine. Um, do you know what criteria are applied by the authority in determining whether or not something is no. a prescribed mine? No. In any event, uh, the Hazelwood mine is is prescribed, and we'll see in a moment that there are additional obligations imposed by the regulations, for example, to carry out safety assessments that are imposed on prescribed mines alone. That's correct. Other mines merely need to comply with the remainder of Part 5.3. Is that right? That's correct. The regulations also refer to mining hazards, and if we could go to Regulation 5.3.2, it's stated that a mining hazard is any activity, procedure, plant, process, substance, situation or other circumstance that could pose a risk to health or safety in relation to presumably one or more of the uh, the issues that are then set out. Is that right? That's correct. And we notice there, and we will return to this um, later, Inspector, that uh, the risk to health or safety is not limited to the health or safety of people working in the mine, is it? No, that's, that's so correct. The risk, yep. consistently with the overall approach of the Act under which these regulations are made, the risk could be to a person employed by the operator of the mine. Do you agree? I agree. It could also be a risk to someone uh, who is a contractor working at the mine. That's correct. It could also be a risk to someone like a firefighter who comes to the mine to deal with a fire. That's correct. And finally, it could be a risk to a member of the public who lives or works in the vicinity of the mine. That's correct. Yeah. So all of those categories of people are... Um, are envisaged, if I can put it that way, by this definition That's of a correct. mining hazard. Now, the particular mining hazard, which uh, of course is the focus of our inquiries, is in paragraph J there, that is mine fires or explosions. So for our purposes, uh, a fire that could pose a risk to health or safety of a person falls within the definition of a mining hazard. That's correct. <coughs> We can see the significance of something being a mining hazard if we look at Regulation 
we see that the operator of a mine, and here we're looking at all mines, not just prescribed mines, must adopt risk control measures that eliminate so far as is reasonably practicable risk to health or safety associated with any mining hazards at the mine, or if it's not reasonably practicable to eliminate those risks, reduce those risks so far as is reasonably practicable. Once again, that's consistent with the obligations that employers have under the OHS Act. That's correct. But here there are specific requirements imposed on the operator of the mine. I mentioned a moment ago um, that the focus of the uh, audit activities is on major mining hazards. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And a major mining hazard, I don't think we need to go to the definition unless, unless you need to, uh, but it's in Regulation 1.1.5 of these regulations, and it tells us that a major mining hazard is a mining hazard that has the potential to cause an incident that would cause or pose a significant risk of causing more than one death. That's, That's right, isn't it? Um, and major mining hazards, that is mining hazards that have that additional potential, are uh, the subject of particular requirements in, uh, in the regulations uh, to do with safety assessments. Is, it, is that That's right? That's correct. All right, we'll come to that presently. We can leave the regulations for the moment and go back to the answer you gave to Ms Petering's question about um, verification inspections. As I understand your statement, and it's also referred to in the statement from uh, Mr Kelly, which has been provided to the inquiry, um, the VWA engages in annual verification inspections. That's correct. Um, in relation to... Now, is it prescribed mines or is it only that list of 12 mines that are considered to be the most, uh, to have the most significant risks? I believe so, yes. And I, th I believe that those 12 sites that are on that list are prescribed mines. Okay. Um, but do we assume that not all of the prescribed mines are on that list? That's correct. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so we can understand that, perhaps if I can refer to Mr Kelly's statement, we don't need to have it brought up on the screen, um, but Mr Kelly tells us just bear with me a moment please Mr Hayes uh, this is paragraph 10 of his statement, he says the annual verification process for the 12 highest risk ranked mines was introduced in the sector by the VWA in late 2010. Uh, does that accord with your recollection? Yeah, yes, I believe so. All right. Um, and uh, this ranking of the 12 highest ranked mines in Victoria, um, do you know if that's a publicly accessible list? No. No, I don't believe it is a publicly accessible list. OK. Um, do you know where the Hazelwood Open Cut Mine sits on that, on that list? in terms of whether it's considered to be the most hazardous or, or where is it? I can't recall whether it's number one or number three or number five, but I do believe that it would be in the top five. OK. Yeah. Um, and presumably along with the other two open-cut mines. Yes. yes, yes, that's correct. And as you say, Mr Kelly says, um, the annual verification inspections that you're involved in are tailored to uh, that list of 12 in general terms, is that right? I'm sorry, what? The... I'll, I'll, perhaps I'll reword that question. Um, you, you, your work focuses on carrying out annual inspection, ver annual verification inspections at the three open cut mines in the valley. That's correct. Right. And you attach to your statement um, the reports of three such verification inspections that you've been engaged in as the lead inspector in 2011, 2012 and 2013. Um, I'm not going to take you to each of those, but each deals with a, a different major mining hazard. That's right? correct. How is it determined what the 
hazard, what the major mining hazard will be for a given year's inspection? Yeah. Who makes that decision? A team decision yes. based on, uh, I guess, an analysis of incidents that have occurred in relation to those mining hazards that then in effect obviously major mining hazards. Um, industry trends, uh, other other incidents that have occurred elsewhere across across the other sites as well that, that would come into play. So jacking of plants, vehicle interaction and of course fires. The one I'm going to ask you about, and this won't surprise you, is that in 2012 um, the verification inspection focused on mine fires. That's correct. And are you able to tell us what the particular reason was for the focus on mine fires in 2012? Yeah. Look, the primary reason we focused on mine fires at Hazelwood in 2012, um, in essence, centred around an incident that they, they had um, had in January of 2012, where yes. they'd lost a, a significant portion of the machine due, due to a fire. The inquiry uh, has some information about the 2012 uh, fire and they involved a, a dredger, did it not? That's correct. Yeah. So the occurrence of that incident led to the verification inspection focusing on fires. Was it just at Hazelwood that you focused on fires or did you look no. at fires at the other two open Across cut Across the other two, well? that is correct. Now, if I can ask you please to turn to tab two of your statement, and I'll ask you some questions about the report that was produced as a result of those inspect that inspection. Um, it's referred to as an inspection, but uh, it's correct to say, isn't it, that this was this is a form of audit that is carried out by by WorkCover? That, that's correct. Um, and. Has conducting audits of this type been part of the training? Have you been specifically trained in how to go about conducting this type of audit? I have been trained, yes. What was the nature of that training, Inspector? Are we talking within WorkSafe or external to WorkSafe? Or well, let, let's start with history. within, within uh, WorkSafe. I think we're now required to say work cover, aren't we? I'll have its, I'll have its Apologies. die hard. Apologies. Um, no, that's all right. Uh, yes, let's start with within work cover. What um, what training in relation to conducting audits have been given? Primarily, it is on the job training through mentoring, and my training or my mentoring was through Greg Slesia. Okay. If you could have a look, please, at page. Seven of the of the report. Um, your focus, as I read this, the focus of your team um, was on an examination of the safety management system that was in place at the mine. Is that right? That is correct. All right. There's a requirement, isn't there, under the Part Five Point Three of the regulations? for the operator of a prescribed mine to have in place a safety management system? That is correct, yeah. And uh, at heading 4.2.2 of the report, uh, you list safety assessment, and you, uh, the report then says the mine provided SAs, that's safety assessments, is that that's right? That's correct. All of which were incomplete and appeared to be undergoing development. Of the several major mining hazards, assessed fire was included. The incomplete uh, safety assessments that were provided to you became one of the main focuses of this uh, verification process, did it not? It did, but if I can provide some clarity around that statement there. Sure. And it's, it's not totally correct in saying that the mine provided safety assessments, all of which were incomplete. My understanding, and I was part of this um, verification, was is that we only focused on the mine fire safety assessments. So not all the safety assessments that the mine have conducted were focused on within this verification. Understand? Yeah. 
What I want to ask you about is the table that we see immediately under that part. Do you see the table 4.2.3, selected SMS element findings <coughs> summary? That's correct. Um, on the left hand side we see a heading SMS element mm -hmm. and then there are three, SMS 1, SMS 2 and SMS 3. Can you explain to us what, what, they, what that means? Well, look, a, safe, a safety management system obviously comprises of a number of different elements, um, and I, I'd be referring back to Australian Standard 4801 at the time. Now, those elements obviously include hazard identification, incident management, and there are another, obviously, other elements within a, a safety management system. Yes. The safety assessment is another element of that safety management system, and it stands to reason that those two documents or, or two um, processes should be interlinked. Understand. Um, the next column along, moving towards the right of the page, has a heading implemented. And, That's we, and we see that next to safety assessment mine fires, the word no appears. What does that mean? Well, in, in essence, we look at two, two sides of the fence, so to speak. Yes. Does the site have a system in place? Is it implemented? And then, and that that'll include documentation and processes that they may already have in place. Yes. The functional side is then: is it working? Is it present out in the field? So the theory and the practice, essentially. Yes. You're looking at both of them. That's correct. Okay. Um, and in relation to safety assessment, mine fires, um, we see no in relation to each of those, and. The next column is level. Can you explain to us what level means? Well, the, the level is an arbitrary figure. I guess that's contained in the back of the uh, verification document. There's, there is a table on page 38. I'm sorry, on 30, page 39. This is the... The, that, that's guide, the, table, essentially, the guide, essentially, the, yes. the table. And we see that there are uh, levels from zero to six. Uh, that's correct. And you get a six if your answer yes and yes to the theory and the practice. That's Is that right? And you get a zero if you answer no and no to the theory and the practice. And so if we go back to the table, um, that's why there's a zero in the, in the third column. That's correct. Is that right? And then... The final column there is comments. Documentation, documentation obtained is incomplete and cannot be considered a safety assessment. So that's the description of why, why they got a zero, essentially. A, a very broad type of statement, yes. All right. Um, now, can I ask you to go back to the, the regulations, please, so that we can get some understanding of what a safety assessment is, what it is that you're looking for. If we can go to regulation 5.3.23... This requirement is in um, subdivision three of this part of the regulations which imposes additional duties on uh, in relation to prescribed mines. Is that right? That's correct. We've already uh, talked briefly about safety management systems. That's another thing that has to be there only for prescribed mines. Um, so can we try and understand it this way that every workplace in Victoria Victoria has to comply with the duties in the Act, the Occupational Health and Safety Act. That's correct. Um, and broadly speaking, that is to safeguard, so far as reasonably practicable, their employees and others that may be affected by their undertakings. If you're operating a mine, not only do you have to comply with those duties, but you also have to comply with the duties in Part 5.3 of the regulations. That's right. And then if you're operating a prescribed mine, the requirements are increased yeah. again because there are these additional obligations. That's correct. Um, and I know you didn't draft the regulations, but no doubt your training has taught you, Inspector, that those additional requirements are there to deal with uh, the high levels of risk associated with operating a prescribed That's mine. One of those requirements is in this regulation 5.3.23, uh, 
And as I understand the regulations, and correct me if I'm wrong, Inspector, but this obligation to carry out a safety assessment as required by this regulation is only imposed on operators of prescribed mines and also operators of major hazard facilities. Is that correct? I can't comment on the major hazard facilities regulations. That's it's not an area that I deal with. Okay. But it is correct with these regulations and prescribed mines, yes, okay. that we're looking at here on the screen. Um, and can you explain to us what what uh, safety purpose is served by a safety assessment of a major mining hazard? Why is why is that requirement there from your perspective? What does it achieve? Yeah, look, there are a number of reasons, obviously. Um, mining to be deemed, I guess, a, um, a hazardous industry, so to speak, and I think that sits under the definitions as well. But more importantly, the safety assessment, um, for want of another word, is an assessment and a study of those identified major mining hazards that may pose the risk, risk of, uh, for want of another word, greater than more than one, more than one fatality. This requirement to carry out a safety assessment, the purpose of it is to lead to the identification of appropriate controls of the risks identified. Is that right? So far as reasonably practical, yes. yes. Uh, Mr Neist, in his statement, explains to the inquiry that WorkCover's broad approach to regulation um, is based on a recognition that the owner of the risk is in the best place to address that risk so far as is reasonably practicable. Would you agree generally with yep. that approach? Yes. And that forms part of your work, does it not, as an inspector, that basic underlying principle? Absolutely. And the obligation under 5.3.23 is a specific example of that broad principle in relation to prescribed mines. That's correct. And. Uh, Sub-regulation 2 explains that a safety assessment must involve an investigation and analysis of the major mining hazards in order to provide the operator with a detailed understanding of all aspects of risks to health or safety associated with major mining hazards. If we, if we look at that specifically in the context of fires in mines, which is obviously the focus of this inquiry, then what is required here is that the operator investigate and analyse uh, fires that can lead to one or more fatalities, is that right? Yes, that, that is correct, that A, they would identify scenarios that lead to those um, consequences, more than one fatality. So in saying that there, not, not every fire or not every instance of a fire would be considered a major mining hazard. Understand. But it's, it's the operator that would then um, decide which one is and which one isn't based on, on their knowledge and experience. Right. Um, once again, we see in sub-regulation 2, don't we, that risks to health or safety are not limited to risks to employees of the operator. Those risks could be to any one of the categories of people we spoke about earlier. Is that right? Through the conduct of the undertaking, yes, that's correct. Yes, yeah. Um, so the risk could be to members of the public and so on, the categories that you talked about. If we go to sub-regulation 4, it says the operator must document all aspects of the safety assessment. Why is it important from a safety perspective for these things to be documented? Well, it, look, it stands to reason, obviously, that there is a um, clear instructions a clear um, definition as to what they have actually come about, uh, what they've identified. Yes. But more importantly, they can uh, pass on that information to whoever needs that information, so it's readily accessible, and I think it does go down further and talk about that. Yes. So rather than being a word of mouth It's intended... System. Sorry, Inspector. No, um, as you've said, paragraph F, I think, is what you're talking about. 4F, it has to be set out and expressed in a way that is readily cons comprehensible to all who use it. Um, so the users of the safety assessment uh, would include the employees of the operator who have to put it into effect. Is that right? That's correct. Right. If we can go back to uh, 4A, the safety assessment's got to describe the methods used in the investigation and the analysis. 
and then state the nature of each mining hazard and the likelihood of the major mining hazard causing or contributing to causing any harm to any person and the severity of the harm that may be caused. Um, that's classic risk assessment approach, is it not? Yes, that's correct. And uh, if we can focus our inquiry here on the major mining hazard of, of fire in a mine, I'd like to ask you about the sorts of sorts of considerations, the sorts of things you want to see examined in order to determine the likelihood of a mine fire causing or contributing any harm to any person. Specifically what I mean by that is, would you expect, for example, in relation to the Hazelwood mine, would you expect to see a recognition in the safety assessment of the proximity of the mine to the town of Morwell? Again, with regards to risk to health and safety of employees and other people, if the site had identified, if the operator identified that, then yes, we would absolutely want to see that in the safety assessment. It's not just a matter of if the operator identified it. Yeah. You're not guided by what the operator identifies, I take it, in determining whether or not they've complied with the regulation. Are you? No, oh, obviously not, no. No. Yeah. Um, so it would be appropriate, wouldn't it, in a safety assessment of the Hazelwood mine fire, of, sorry, fire in the Hazelwood mine, to recognise the proximity of the mine to the town of Morwell? Well, then I'll clarify that. The operator, or if VWA, obviously deem that to be a major mining hazard, then yes, we would, we would expect to see that in some documentation. Because a scenario where a mine is as close to a town as the Hazelwood mine is different to a scenario where um, there's several kilometres between the mine boundary and the nearest town. You'd agree with that yes, general absolutely. proposition? Would you expect to see in a safety assessment for the major mining hazard of fire at the Hazelwood mine some reference to previous fires that had occurred at the Hazelwood mine? Whether it was a reference or issues that were taken into consideration when, with the development of the safety assessment, yes. Because if there'd been previous fires that had led to investigations that set out recommendations, and whether or not those recommendations had been implemented would impact on the likelihood of a fire causing harm, That's would it not? <coughs> And there are similar considerations, I don't want to go through each of them with you, but there are similar considerations you'd expect to see in dealing with what's at paragraph three there, if we could just go down the page to B, please, for B3. So these are the three things that the assessment needs to state, the nature of the major mining hazard, the likelihood of the major mining hazard causing or contributing to causing any harm to any person. And then the third one I want to ask you about, the severity of the harm that may be caused. Focusing on what this inquiry has been dealing with, a fire that burnt and shrouded the town of Morwell for over a month in smoke and ash and the like, um, the severity of the harm is in part a function of how long the fire is likely to burn for. Do you agree with that, as far as the public is concerned? I believe the severity of harm leads to the definition of a major mining hazard in terms of fatalities in relation to that particular statement there. I don't necessarily agree that the, you would need to perform a safety assessment to work out the severity of harm if it was smoke inhalation that led to some type of chronic illness. I think, it's, I think it's quite clear that it refers back to the major mining hazard itself. If I understand you correctly, Inspector, you're saying because it's a major mining hazard, it has the potential to cause a fatality, that's automatically taking you to the highest that's level correct. in terms of severity. That's correct. I understand. Paragraph 
paragraph C requires there to be reasons for the decisions reached about those matters that we've been talking about. Um, and then paragraph D requires a description of all measures considered for the control of risks associated with major mining hazards. So if I'm understanding the process correctly, the identification, the uh, risk assessment takes place under, um, under regulation we've been talking about, comes to a conclusion about the likelihood of the hazard causing harm, considers the severity, and then, importantly, you go on and control those uh, risks as they've been identified. Is that right? That's correct. All right. Um, and as I think you've already told us, uh, the requirement to control is a requirement that is conditional on it being reasonably practicable That's to correct. achieve that control. But the safety assessment, as I read this regulation, requires a description of the reasons for adopting or rejecting all of the risk controls measured. Is that right? That's correct. And, and why do you look for that? What's the importance of that from a safety perspective? I believe it goes back to the um, reasonable, practical um, scenario. Have they identified ways that they can eliminate the hazard as opposed to so far as reasonably practical. So we've got an idea then of what the operator is thinking when they're controlling that risk. But more so, I think that the operator has that understanding as well. So the requirement's this, isn't it? That they, in light of their assessment, they then consider the range of control mechanisms that might be available to deal with the risk identified. Is that right? <coughs> Yes, I think that's correct, yeah. And they uh, then have to document why they've chosen some and rejected others, essentially. That's correct. And the rejection might be because it's not practicable or it's too expensive or whatever it happens to be. That's correct. But the safety assessment has to record the thinking, if I can that's put correct. it that way. All right. With that understanding of what's required by the regulation in mind, can we go back, please, to the verification uh, behind tab two, the verification report. And if I can draw your attention, please, to page 24 of 43 in the report. You see the page numbers at the bottom of the page. There's a heading control measure six, annual fire safety audits. Um, these con numbered control measures, and you've numbered it as CM0288, that's a, a designation that the operator of the mine gave to a particular control that it had in place. That's correct. Is that right? That's correct. And this control was that they, uh, according to the document, that they, they conducted an annual fire safety audit. That's correct. On the next page, halfway down, in bold we see review corrective actions generated from the 2006 mine fire investigation recommendations are all actions completed or closed. Um, I, I know this is nearly, or well, it is two years ago, Inspector, but do you recall why you were particularly focused on the 2006 mine fire investigation? particular focus, no I can't, and probably more importantly, just for clarification, the document, as, as we see here on the screen here, is set up by a mining engineer to ask those questions, so maybe the mining engineer at the time um, had some particular focus in that area. The mining engineer that's employed through uh, VWA. Yes, I understand, as part of your team. That's correct, part of the team. Right. Um, and uh, I'm just looking to see the name of that engineer. Do you recall who it was? Was it um, Mr... Wally Morrison, I Morrison, think, if that's, was it? if that's the right name we're looking at. Okay, so he was part of your that's team. That's correct, yeah. And he identified that, and um, we'd need to ask him if we needed to know why it was a re reference correct, to 2006. Yeah. The reason I ask that, Inspector, and you may not be able to assist us here, we heard evidence yesterday mm -hmm. from, um, from Kylie White. Were you present in the hearing room no, yesterday? No. Uh, Ms White 
is the executive director of the what's been referred to here as the mine regulator at DSDBI. Um, she told us that during the time in which her agency was regulating health and safety in mines, so before 1st January 2008, that an inspector had issued an improvement notice in relation to these very recommendations in the 2006 mine fire investigation and had signed it off saying, yes, that they'd all been implemented. Mm. Um, were you aware of that at the time you were doing this no. report? I, I have become aware of that since. Okay. Part of the inquiry, but no, not definitely not at that time, no. All right. It, it raises a broader question and it may be beyond your area to answer this, but um, when you carried out this investigation and, in, sorry, this verification report and the others that you've done, um, do you have access to the uh, DPI files in relation to the Hazelwood mine relating to their activities before 1 January 2008? No, no, I don't. If you wanted to find out what had happened, for example, in relation to the 2006 mine, you'd presumably be able to make that inquiry of DSDBI? I think there'd be mechanisms within WorkSafe that would be able to do that. And yes, I'd, I'd refer that back to my group leader or to my manager to make those inquiries, yes. All right. Um, the inquiry has been told by Ms White in her statement that as part of the transfer of the responsibility uh, taking effect on 1 January 2008, that electronic copies of their files, that is the previous mm. files, did come over to uh, VWA. Is that not your understanding, that you have direct access to their electronic records? I couldn't answer records? that. No, I, look, I, I haven't seen any of that, so yeah, I can't answer it, whether we have access or not. And just whilst we're on that part of the verification report, um, the inquiry is particularly interested uh, to understand a later fire investigation report, one in relation to a 2008 uh, fire that actually occurred after the time that work cover took over. <coughs> but I, I think, in fairness to you, Inspector, there's no suggestion that you attended at Hazelwood in relation to that fire. But my question is, are you, do you have any familiarity with, with that report that no. was produced? No. no. It's been no part of your role in relation to Hazelwood to examine whether or not its recommendations have been implemented at the mine? No. Now, if we can go over, please, to page 33 of your report. This is where you deal with the um, SMS element 2. We looked at that earlier, Inspector, where uh, you found that neither the theory nor the practice had been um, satisfactorily addressed in relation to a safety assessment for mine fire. Um, in the middle of that page, there's a heading performance and then implemented, and then there are five um, statements. I take it there, that's what you were looking for. They're the, they're, they're the that's questions. what's guiding you. They're the that's questions correct. that needed to be questions. answered. Yep. All right. And of course, what you were principally <laughs> interested to establish is whether or not there'd been compliance with regulation 5.3.23, what we've just been looking at. Yeah, that's right. Isn't certain it? elements, yeah, absolutely. You turn the page, uh, please. Uh, the top of page 34. There's a heading: um, A safety assessment exists for the identified major mining hazard mine fires, and you say management provided a copy of the Bowtide diagram titled Mine Fire B7 dated 3 March 2010. Prior to the verification, there's evidence that a safety assessment had been carried out for the identified major mining hazard, that is, fire. And you go on, management also provided copies of control description sheets that have been developed post-March 2010. You were provided with some documents that the operator of the mine, GDF Sewers, said, here, this is what demonstrates that we have conducted a safety assessment, that we have engaged in the process set out in Regulation 
in essence, to answer that question, a safety system exists for identified major mining hazard, yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, you say that, uh, if I can summarise it this way, that it was a, a good start, but it was incomplete. Is that is that a fair, fair way? Assessment. That's what I mean. Um, and you noted in particular that there was a document dated December 2009 that identified further work that needed to be carried out, risk assessments to be carried out for each of the scenarios in the major mining hazards uh, to demonstrate the risk has been reduced to as low as reasonably practicable. You say, management informed me that the assessments as stated in the above mentioned document have not been completed. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. And it was based on that information that you then reached the conclusion that they hadn't done what they were required to do by way of a safety assessment? That is correct. And the statement above where I, I think I mentioned here, the other 27 sheets do not contain any information. So the control descriptor sheets were empty as well. Were you, so I'm trying to understand the process you're engaged in, were you looking to see whether the documentation they'd produced matched the requirements of Regulation 5.3.23? Looking back at this document and two years ago, I would suggest that we looked at certain elements of 5.3.23 in relation to 3D, 23.4A, 23.2, as set out on the first page, page 33. Um, do I understand that evidence to be that now, with the benefit of hindsight looking at this, there are aspects of Regulation 5.3.23 that you did not consider? In this verification? Yes. That's correct. You ultimately issued an improvement notice because you formed the view that by failing to comply with Regulation 5.3.23 that uh, GDF Sewer was, was in breach of their obligation under Section 21 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, that is, to safeguard their employees so far as is reasonably practicable. And the uh, improvement notice, if we could go to it, is behind tab 19 of your, of your statement. Um, there are, in fact, two improvement notices behind tab 19. Disregard the first improvement notice uh, for the moment and look at the second notice. Do you have that in front of you? Yes. I think we're just. Seem to have a technical problem, Mr. Hayes. I'll just ask you to bear with us for a moment if you could, please. So we'll, we'll just proceed in the old-fashioned way, I think, uh, Inspector. Um, you issued this notice, as we see, on the 21st of June 2012. And without taking it to it, it's accompanied by an entry report, a report of what you did at the, on the day. That's behind tab 18. And the report and the notice were given to Mr Luke Deepvorst. We can see that. Did you understand him to be the CEO of the, uh, of the operator of the that's mine? Correct. So you were dealing with him personally along with other management officials, is that right? Dealing with Luke yes. through his management team. OK. Yeah. Um, just so I understand that, were you actually dealing with him in person as well? Not with regards to this. OK. No. Um, and uh, the notice, not surprisingly given the evidence you've just given, identifies that in your... Uh, opinion there was a failure to comply with the regulation and section 21 and on the second page of it there's a, on the left hand side directions to be taken to remedy that contravention and you have said that the uh, 
mine operator identified there as Australian Power Partners, BV and others, but that's essentially what we're all referring to as GDF, GDF sewers, must conduct a comprehensive and systematic safety assessment in order to assess the risks associated with the major mining hazard mine fires. And you gave them until the 1st of October 2012 to comply exactly. with your notice. You went back there, as it turns out, on the 8th of October 2012 to check on compliance. Is that right? If you look behind tab 20, Inspector, there's a... It seems to be the, correct. the report that you completed when you went back there. Um, and uh, as you state in that report, you went there to uh, follow up on your notice and <clears throat> I want to understand what you did, because ultimately you concluded, didn't you, that the notice had been complied That's with. Correct. In other words, you were satisfied that there had been compliance with Regulation 5.3.23 based on what happened on this day, is that right? Satisfied that they had addressed those concerns that we raised with them, yes, on the 21st of June. And just so that we understand, those concerns were the matters that had been, been identified in the document from 2009 that said they had to do some more work. Further work, that's Further correct. work. Um, and so that's what you were focused on, ensuring that they had, in fact, done the further work that had been that's identified correct. earlier. That's correct. I understand. Now, uh, as I understand this report, you were uh, provided with an updated version of the document that you looked at previously. That's correct. Is that right? Um, and we have a document which we understand is the one that you were provided, and it's in that uh, it's in the folder that was tendered at the start of today. Tab twenty six. Um, some background uh, members of the board. This is a document, the document I'm about to take Inspector Hayes to was provided to the inquiry um, by solicitors for GDF sewers under cover of the letter dated the 2nd of May that was tendered earlier. And uh, it's a document which for uh, identification was behind tab 26 of the third of the folders that was given to the inquiry under cover of that letter. That's Mr. what we... Mr Rosen, does this have a name, this document? Uh, it does. It's headed uh, IPR GDF Sewers Major Mining Hazard 7 Mine Fire Major Fire. Is that a fair description of it, Inspector? But how, That's correct. how would you refer to it, though, uh, Mr Hayes? This, this document on the yeah. screen, what would you call that? I would call that the bow tie diagram. The bow tie, yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's a term we're going to get used to, I think, over the next couple of days. It's a, it's a bow tie. Um, because it's essentially two sides tied in the middle. Is that right? If we, look at the, if we just um, look at the entire document, the, the tie bit is the blue line, essentially. Is that...? Well, you look, the theory behind it all is, is that you've got your causes of what may eventuate yes. to the centrepiece there, which talks about a major mine fire and a mine fire, and then you've got your um, your consequences on the, the right-hand side, which is... Which you scroll across the screen there. Um, this is a relatively conventional s style of document uh, for this purpose? I believe so, yeah. yeah. Um, and... Uh, in your entry report, um, you say you were provided with a document of this description, um, but dated the 19th of September 2012. Putting the date to one side for the moment, um, is that the document that was shown to you when you went back on the 8th of October? It looks similar, but yeah. Um, now, in fairness to you, this, as we can see, is, is two pages. Um, the one that's been provided to the inquiry is dated October the 22nd, 2012, um, which, of course, is after the date on which you attended on the 8th of October. Um, 
this might be a difficult question to answer, but are there any differences from looking at that to the one that you were provided with, or are you not able I, I to say tell. that? I couldn't tell. Look, and it's, it's, yeah, I couldn't tell whether there's any difference there. Um, but in any event, you saw a document of this style and with this general content, uh, but dated a, mo correct. a month earlier than this one, and attached to this bow tie diagram are a large number of um, of other documents, which are the various system controls numbered. Is that right? That's correct. I believe they'll title that control descriptor sheets, so the system controls and other critical controls that they may have in place here. All right. Um, Sorry, Mr Hayes, this may be a really dumb question. Could you read the print when it was given to you? <laughs> yes, I can. It was on an A3 sheet, so I, I don't know whether the, the sheets that um, council got there are clear, but yeah. It, it might be age, but I'm certainly struggling to read it. But as I as I read it, Inspector, it's um, on the left hand side. There's various uh, identified causes of a fire, including, as we see on the second page, bushfire. So we see on the left hand column there the second That's yellow great. box, bushfire. Mm -hmm. And then moving towards the right, there's the identification of several of the control um, control documents that are then attached that are identified as being relevant to reducing the risk of a, of a bushfire impacting on the mine. Is that right? That's correct. All right. And then if we trace further along towards the right, there's a dark blue box and... Inside that box, believe it or not, it says assessed risk level equals as low as reasonably practical. If you can read green that, box. but I'd ask that you accept green. Yep. Yeah. All right. <laughs> but that's what it says. That's correct. Um, and uh, a similar process without going to each of them is dealt with other causes of fire. That was the document that was provided to you on the 8th of October, is that right? With, yes, with very those, yes. Yeah, well, yes. Sorry, all very similar, yes. with the various attached controls. That's correct. And what you saw is that the incomplete controls that had been identified on your previous visit had now, in fact, been completed. That's correct. Is that right? You were also given another document for completeness, Inspector, um, which uh, you've identified in your report as being some minutes of a meeting dated the 4th and 5th of October 2012, which you say you took away from the site. That's correct. Yep. Um, those minutes were not attached to your statement. That's not a criticism of you, but we have made an inquiry and we've been provided with those minutes. And I'd ask you to have a look at this document, please, and um, tell us whether these are the minutes that were given to you. Take a moment to look at those, please. Copies are being provided to the parties. Were they the minutes that I were so. given to you? I tender those as part of Mr Hayes's statement. So, am I correct in understanding, Inspector, they, they were the documents that were shown to you on the 8th of October that led you to determine that the notice had been complied with? That's correct. Right. Was anything else shown to you at that time? The control descriptor sheets that sit behind the bow tie diagram. Yes, and in fairness to you, I haven't taken you to those. Um, 
but there are there are very many in That's excess of 100 of those. So you you looked at those. Um, I'll, I'll clarify. I looked at a random sample of those. I didn't look at every 100 sheets. Thank you. Um, my question is a pretty simple one. Um, that documentation doesn't seem to me, maybe I'm missing something, doesn't seem to me to match what is required of a safety assessment under Regulation 5.3.23. Could you comment on that? Yeah. I guess at the time I was looking to see that the site had addressed my concerns that I'd raised through the verification. Yes. Now that spoke about completing documentation completing the control descriptor sheets and then obviously the, the requirement to consult with their workforce. I did I don't believe I tested those five three twenty three every requirement against the documentation that was put in front of me, just the actual um, identified issues that, that were raised through the verification. I understand. I'm, I'm not going to take you to each of them, but I do want to ask you about one because you identified it earlier as being a very important part of the requirement under the regulation. Nowhere do we see in any of that documentation any explanation for which control mechanisms have been considered and whether they've been implemented or not and reasons for that. Do you agree that that's not in that documentation? I agree. But again, that's something that VWA would actually have to ask the side at some point now as to whether all those controls that they considered were implemented or whether there are other controls that they rejected along the way. I'll be a bit more specific if I could. The focus of this inquiry has been, as I'm sure you're aware, fires in worked out parts of the mine. That's correct. We don't see a reference, do we, in that documentation to that particular matter? No, we don't. We don't see any consideration of the likelihood of such a fire occurring. Would you agree with that? I agree. We don't see any consideration of the severity of such a fire if it did occur. Do you agree with that? I agree. We don't see any consideration of what might be put in place to reduce the risk of such a fire occurring. Do you agree with that? I agree. And would you agree there are important matters that one would expect to see in a safety assessment carried out under these regulations dealing with major mining fire? I would agree in terms of going back to the definition of a major mining hazard, yes. Do you know if any decision has been made about what the subject of the 2014 verification audit is going to be? Not at this point, no. Right. Um, when would you expect to be told what the, what the topic is for this year? Shortly. Pretty soon? Yeah. All right. Now, I want to ask you about um, one other matter, Inspector, and it concerns uh, some visits that you made to this mine, the Hazelwood mine, this year, more recently. Um, and just for completeness, you attended at the uh, mine in relation to issues associated with the safety of firefighters in February of this year. That's correct. And I'm not going to take you to that in detail because it was dealt with when, um, when your boss, Mr Kelly, was giving evidence. Um, but you went to the site uh, at least on one occasion with a Mr Grayson, a hygienist employed by WorkCover. That's correct. And he's a generalist. He, his uh, role relates to all aspects of WorkCover's work, does it not? I understand that he's a hygienist. Yes. A, a, a employed as a specialist, but he's an inspector as well. OK. Um, he's not attached to the unit that you work in, though, is he? No. No. And you brought him in because you wanted to call on his additional expertise in relation to carbon monoxide exposure, specifically? The hazards associated with, with fire in, in terms of, yes, atmosphere and, and health monitoring, yes. Um, are they matters which, have been, which you've been trained in, specifically? 
In addition to your visits, and you, you um, include the entry reports for those visits and they speak for themselves, but subsequent to those visits, you went back to uh, the Hazelwood mine and the report that you prepared is behind tab 26. If I can ask you to... Uh, this is tab 26 to your statement. And uh, at the bottom, so we see there's a visit on the 20th of March of this year. So that's very close, is it not, to the date on which the fire was declared safe? Do you recall when that was? It was around about the 20th of March, I believe was it so, not? towards the end of the month, yes. OK. And is that why you were there on this date, was it, or is that a coincidence? Um, I believe it's a coincidence because we worked, uh, VWA did attend on or around the day that that, that was transitioning. Um, if I'll just go through this here. Sure. Yeah, uh, look, I, I believe it, it was a coincidence that we did attend prior to the, the fire being declared safe. Um, if I refer to the, the next the next tab, oh, sorry, tab 28, that was when we did go in on the 25th of the 3rd. Right. So what was the trigger for this attendance? Are you able to tell us? The one on the 20th of March? The one on the 20th. Again, just to make some broad inquiries into the site, how they're managing um, certain aspects of the fire um, and plans once the area has been made safe, what the, what the um, operator is intending to do with regards to assessments, um, systems of work, and looking at the, uh, the dot points there, there was a discussion obviously on uh, major mining hazards number seven and the mine fire services equipment. Yes. Um, you dealt with a number of uh, managerial employees of the mine operator, Mr Harkins, Mr Dugan, we see referred to on the first page. That's correct. And others. Um, and at the top of the second page, you relate what uh, what you were told, as I understand it, by uh, those members of management about the circumstances in which the fire occurred on the 9th of February. Is that right? I'm sorry, can you repeat yeah. that again? I'm reading it. That first paragraph, mm -hmm. under the heading Mine Fire Services Equipment, as I understand, you're recording there what you were told by... Uh, management about the circumstances in which fire started That's to burn in the mine on the 9th of February. That's you were told that burning embers entered the, into the mine around midday, with embers hitting the operating faces and grass level around this time. Approximately an hour or so later, a number of spot fires appeared along the non-working batters, i.e. northern batters, and it is believed that a change in wind direction and burning embers also sparked these fires. So that's what you were told on this That's day. correct. That's their belief, yes. All right. Um, and uh, was that at a meeting at which all of the people that um, you've listed on the first page were present, that conversation, or was it with one individual, do you recall? I can't recall if everyone was there, no, right. at that, that particular part, no. OK. Um, in any event, your focus on this day, and uh, you were there the entire day, weren't you, judging from the times on your entry report, you got there at, uh, is it 8.30 a.m. and left at 6.15 p.m.? Does that sound right? That is correct, yeah. Look, it is an abnormally long period of time, but, yeah, that, that is correct. Um, a lot of the time was, was spent uh, travelling around what we know is a very large mine, examining one particular issue, which is whether or not there had been internal compliance by the operator of the mine with one of its own procedures to do with uh, maintaining a, a buffer around the mine area. That is correct. We didn't travel around the whole area of the mine, but there were certain areas of that mine that we did go into, yes. All right. You were particularly focused on one of the controls, the documents that we looked at earlier, number 71, which dealt with fire breaks. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and specifically a requirement in that control 
that there be a continuous 50 metre wide and permanently maintained fire break corridor around the perimeter of the mine to exist all year round. Um, why were you particularly interested in examining that on the 20th of March? I guess in the context of that information that we were provided about burning embers yes. and, and the like entering into the mine on the 9th. And I guess it stands to reason that a control measure of a fire break may help mitigate some of that risk of burning embers flying into the mine. Um, presumably, uh, consistently with the legislation you operate under, your focus was on uh, future risk. Is that right? Correct. Um, and uh, you ultimately determined, did you not, that there wasn't a continuous 50 metre wide and permanently maintained fire break corridor? That is correct. You make specific re reference to seeing um, on some of the worked out batters uh, grass that exceeded 100 millimetres in height and also trees and Yep. shrubs and the like, and we've seen photos of that when Mr Shanahan gave his evidence. And uh, you issued an improvement notice, or further improvement notice, requiring that the um, mine uh, comply with its own procedure to ensure that there was such a 50 metre fire break. That's Is correct. that right? Um, did you give any thought to whether a 50 metres, in light of the events of the 9th of February, whether a 50 metre fire break was adequate? In light of the events, no, we were concerned again about the procedures and processes that the operator had in place. Yes. Whether it was 50 metres or 100 metres, that would all, I guess, get conducted through that an analysis going back again through the safety assessment. Yes. That is a control measure in the safety assessment. If I, if I, I understand... Have, sorry, I have consulted with other members, my group leader, for instance, and yes. we still haven't come to a conclusion at this point, whether 50 metres or 100 metres, or for that matter, a, an adequate fire break. I understand. Yeah. What you were seeking to do was hold them to their own procedure out, rather than going behind the procedure to see whether or not it, it, the correct. procedure itself was adequate. Um, and I think... If I've understood your evidence correctly, that's because you assume that, in light with the requirement to do a safety assessment, that there's been a reasoned process that's led to that 50 that metre correct. figure. I understand. Um, and uh, you gave the mine, um, if I'm right, uh, some time to comply with the notice that you issued. The notice itself is behind tab 27. Perhaps we should just briefly go to that. Um, you required compliance by the 23rd of June of this year. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and uh, have you been back since March to see if uh, work is progressing in relation to that? We matter? have, yes. And, and are you able to tell the inquiry what you saw? Well, at this point, this that control measure, along with a number of other control measures, is still under review at the site, through the operator, obviously. So they haven't given us VWA evidence that they've complied with that notice yet. Right. Um, just if I understand that correctly, are you saying that as part of your post-fire work at the mine, if I can call it that, that you've also examined other aspects of uh, their fire <laughs> mitigation and prevention well, Inquiries are policies. continuing into that area, yes. Um, I don't want you to go in an area you're not comfortable with, but the statement the inquiries received from Mr Adam Watson of WorkCover is to the effect that there is an ongoing investigation into whether or not the operator of the mine complied with its legal obligations. Are you part of that investigation or is this a separate process that you're engaged in? My understanding is the work that our team are continuing to do out there may provide input into that investigation. They're the questions that I have for Inspector Hayes. The members of the board have any questions?
Thank you, Mr Hayes. Um, in the document that um, Council has provided to the parties, this document's produced by GDF Sewers. Um, as part of that, there was a letter also tabled from GDF Sewers solicitors Kingwood Mallisons, and that told us around this, um, it told us about the um, documents under tab 26, which Mr Rosen took us through as the bow tie diagram and all those control That's mechanisms. Correct. So, um, would it, it would be right to assume that that 2012 bow tie diagram is the most recent documentation available? There's no reason I believe to so. So, I'm just curious, and I heard Mr Rosen sort of talk you through, um, I guess, the process you went through around whether or not Regulation 5.2.23 was complied with. And I think the things we, that Mr Rosen and you discussed was around the likelihood of the fire, the severity of the fire and the controls, and also the reasons put in place. And it appears to me as though those documentation, that it's still not complete. It doesn't have those things in, in 5.2, 5.2. Um, could I just talk to you about that and ask your view? Absolutely. So, um, does that documentation meet um, the criteria <laughs> set out in the regulations? That it, it is it a safety assessment? I would have to actually go back and talk to our senior mining engineers and our management as to whether that does meet. I guess just on the pure reading of, and you might like to put 5.3.23 up. Um, I hear what you say, Mr Hayes. I guess I'm just perplexed about the, the things that must be contained in that safety assessment are the things that Mr Rosen talked you through and particularly C, which is um, going up a little bit further. I think it's... 4C, just a bit further down. on screen, particularly the reasons for the decisions um, and E, the reasons for adopting or rejecting the control measures. They didn't appear to be provided. You can't comment and on that. It, it looks like that is the case, yes, at this point in time. So can you talk to me about what's the um, implications of proposedly not complying with this safety assessment or breaching those regulations? Well, if there is a breach of those regulations, obviously WorkSafe have a number of um, tools at their disposal to enforce compliance and obviously one of those is, is the issue of an improvement notice with regards to those matters that you've just raised. Okay, and so um, you'll obviously undertake an inquiry and um, of your own to assess that and, and I think Mr Rosen asked you about whether 2014 might cover off on topics and I guess given the circumstances of the 9th of February, would might that be a topic that you would that is correct. review, have a look at? And I hear, what, I hear what you and Mr Rosen are talking about, that Mr Watson's statement is that there is an ongoing investigation. I guess there's a part of me that's perplexed that a fire took place in the mine, a, a large fire went for a long time, or a number of fires, went for 45 days, and yet there's no breach of, the, of any legislation. Again, our, our inquiries are ongoing into that area. Now, we have, uh, VWA have identified uh, the fire breaks as one particular issue that's been identified, and other areas are still under investigation, under inquiry. All right, I won't push you any further. Thanks, Mr Hayes. So I'm going to just ask one matter, uh, Mr Hayes, following on from Ms Petering's questions. Um, this may seem a naive observation. Tell me if it is. You have a lot of experience of other mine operators uh, and their compliance with these regulations. That's, that's bread and butter of your work, is it not? To a point, yes. Is it your experience that a document prepared to meet a requirement under 5.3.23, at a very base level, you'd expect it to be entitled a safety assessment 
into a given major mining hazard, wouldn't you? I'm sorry, the... If a document was prepared to comply with the requirement to do a safety assessment under this regulation that we were asking you about, the first thing you'd expect to see is that it actually had that title, that it was a document which was a safety assessment of whatever the major mining hazard was. Is that your experience that's, that's, generally? Look, that, that's a fair assessment, but I, I guess working within the industry, we may be more familiar with some documentation than others, and whether the document's titled safety assessment or not, if it looks like a rose and smells like a rose. Someone yeah, famous yeah. said that, I think, yeah. Mr Hayes, yeah. Um, so the, the name is only part of the, Absolutely. Part of the equation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other questions that I have for Mr Hayes, I understand Ms Doyle has some questions, and uh, as does uh, the VG, so. I might just pick up with the topic you were just being asked about, Mr Hayes, and it's worthwhile keeping those regulations on the screen. Um, in light of the answers you've given this morning, it, it, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, you have not specifically addressed in your dealings with Hazelwood whether or not any documents produced by it contain a statement of the matters set out in C, D and E above on the screen as to 5.3.24, 5.3.23. I haven't reviewed any documentation relating to those matters at the site, no. Right. Have you done so with respect to the two other open cut mines in the valley? I can't recall. Okay. Now, when Mr Rosen asked you questions this morning about those <coughs> aspects of that regulation, paras C, D and E, um, he was effectively asking you to, to apply, um, to, to look at those criteria and ask you whether or not they were addressed uh, in the documentation that you've spoken about this morning. But you don't know, do you, whether there are any other documents that meet that descriptor? I don't believe, believe so. Um, I'm going to take you back to, to this issue in a moment, um, but, and we can leave the regulations aside for now. I want to take you back to, to other documents that date back to 2009. Now, Mr Hayes, do you remember attending a workshop conducted at the mine, facilitated by GHD consultants, um, looking at the uh, assessment of mi uh, major mining hazards? That's correct, yes. I'm going to ask that the witness be shown a document. I've brought into court as many spare copies as we could drag out this morning. <clears throat> Sorry, there is one more. For the assistance of the tribunal, this document was produced by GDF Sewers in early May in response to a summons at document 12.01. Now, do you recognise that document, Mr Hayes? Yes, certainly do. And just to orient you, I'm going to take you to a couple of aspects of it, but can you start by looking at page six, I think it is, where there's a list of attendees. And you'll see your name under table three, attendance list. That's correct. Uh, along with the, Mr Slesiak, and I, I assume that's the gentleman you've referred to a couple of times that's this correct. morning as someone who has mentored you and give you some, given you on-the-job training. That's correct. Uh, now, um, if we go back to the title of this document, it's Report for Major Mining Hazards Assessment. But I take it that you understood when you attended this workshop that what was being undertaken was part of the work that goes into performing a safety assessment. That's correct. You weren't thrown by the title of the document and didn't understand what you were attending for. I don't think this document existed when we attended the workshop, so you know. All right, but you knew what you were there for. Absolutely. All right, if we look at the executive summary, uh, it says that Hazelwood Mine commissioned GHD to facilitate safety assessments on their major mining hazards. No doubt in one of the introductory sessions, that purpose or objective of the sessions and the workshops was explained to you and the other attendees. That's correct. Um, and it then goes on to describe um, some of the work done. If you look at the third paragraph on that page, it says that in total, 321 existing controls were listed and the workshop team raised 11 potential controls for possible future implementation. Now, stepping back from that, it seems to me, Mr Hayes, that it's suggesting the workshops looked at work that had already been done and then considered uh, new ideas and, and additional controls that it was worth adding to the process. That is correct. 
if I can provide some clarity around that though, um, I believe there were workshops. WorkSafe, VWA attended one of those workshops. And if mm -hmm. I go back to the uh, attendance, it was in relation to confined spaces. So one out of a number of different safety assessment workshops that were conducted, we attended one, yes. Yes. Uh, is it usual for, um, I'll break this question down, um, employers per se, or if there's a different answer, uh, mine operators, to invite WorkSafe inspectors in to attend these sorts of workshops in-house? I'm sorry, is it... Is it usual for employers? It's not unusual. Right. More so to observe the process that the site's undertaking rather right. than to provide input. Okay. Now, if we look at page one, there's a heading overview and then scope of work. And under scope of work, it says the scope of work for the safety assessments captured the following requirements. And there's reference to the regulations. Uh, then there's reference to conducting a team-based workshop exercise. Then for each risk scenario, identifying the current controls and selecting critical system and risk controls. And then finally, developing performance standards. And Mr Hayes, that's a, a description there, albeit in shorthand form, isn't it, of the process of identifying risk, then identifying controls, and then selecting controls, is it not? That's correct. Can I take you then to assessment methodology on page two? There's a statement of the principles there and it says it will be done according to the Australian standard and according to a, a risk management handbook um, referable to the mining industry published from New South Wales. Are you familiar with the way that the standard and the mining handbook work in the industry? No. All right. Do you, do you uh, regard them as appropriate or inappropriate guidance in this sort of situation? I would have to review them and take that back to find some right. clarity around that. But for the sake of the argument and exercise, the site obviously have identified that. Mm -hmm. Looking at page three, there's then a diagram that shows the process um, according to the standard that's mentioned on the previous page. And it's a flow chart or a flow diagram which refers to establishing the context, um, identifying risks, analysing risks, evaluating risks, and then under treatment or treat risks, it refers to identify the treatment options, evaluate them, select, prepare and implement. Again, albeit in shorthand form, that's a reference, is it not, to evaluating treatment options and then selecting one or more of those which have been evaluated. That is a methodology, yes. And that, that is, it's similarly set out in 4801, the Australian standard as well. All right. Turning to page four, I want to ask you about something that might predate your time. Mm -hmm. It refers here to review of a 2004 study. Now, um, Inspector Hayes, we have a bundle of documentation from 2004 prepared by other consultants called Quest. Before I burden you with those, it may be in light of uh, some things you said to Mr Rosen this morning, you're just not aware of it, but have you seen, either as part of your involvement in this 2009 process or um, in your role as an inspector, a bundle of safety uh, documents and assessments performed by Quest consultants in 2003 and 2004? I can't recall. I have seen Quest documents, but I can't recall whether they relate to Hazelwood or any of the other brown coal sites. All right, just for completeness, I might identify the titles for you. And if you haven't seen them, um, I'll deal with these documents in another way. But I've had uh, provided to me an executive summary prepared by Quest Consulting for International Power uh, Hazelwood but also a bundle of documents titled Stage 1, Identification of Major Mining Hazards, December 03, Stage 2, Semi-Quantitative Risk Assessment, February 2004, and Stage 3, Critical Control Adequacy Assessment, March 2004. Do you know whether you've seen documents of that type? No, I can't recall if I've seen them, no. Can I assume then that you didn't have them in mind when you undertook and prepared your verification report in 2012 and the improvement notice and the compliance notice we've looked at from 2012. That's correct. Right. But you can see, can't you, on page four of this 2009 document that part of the task engaged in by GHD consultants in facilitating this workshop was to review work that had been done in 2004 and you can see at paragraph 2.2 mm -hmm. that this was done to recognise the hazards that are still applicable and then identify new hazards. Uh, Mr. Uh, Inspector Hayes, is it an um, appropriate methodology 
uh, in conducting a safety assessment of this kind to capture work that's been done and then look at which of it remains applicable and valid and then identify um, new hazards or improvements to the document underlying. Yeah, absolutely. You can see at paragraph 2.3 that there's then a depiction of a bow tie diagram in its generic form. Um, I, I take it from whatever involvement you had during the sessions you attended that you would have had the opportunity to confirm that the bow tie approach was what uh, provided a framework to the completion of these assessments. Then you can see at page five, there's a bit more of a description of how the bow tie validation was done, that it started with an update of the 2004 material. Um, then there's a description of the workshop process. And I take it from what you've just said that you didn't attend all the subject matter workshops, you focused in on one. That's correct. Now, um, I think you might have been taken to page 19 of this document, or at least asked about it, but it's worth us looking at it again. And there, there's an identification of further work, risk, risk assessment of scenarios, an indication that the scenarios that have been identified would then be um, subjected to a risk assessment That's process. Great. Now, um, you were taken this morning to the verification I, I seek to tender the 2009 report, if the tribunal pleases, the one titled uh, Report for Major Mining Hazards Assessment, Interim Submission, December 2009. Yes, the, the I don't want to interrupt my friend, but we note that it's a draft, and uh, what's not clear, really, especially given that the witness hasn't seen it, is what its status is. Um, perhaps some clarification might be provided in that regard, in due course. Well, I'm happy for the document to be marked for identification that can be dealt with later, but the, the relevance through this witness is that it conforms with his recollections of a <coughs> meeting that he attended. Uh, this is uh, treated as Exhibit 68, but uh, I accept that a, it is appropriate that there be further discussion in relation to status. may not need to go to it, but I want to ask you a couple of questions arising from your verification um, inspection document, which was at attachment two. Um, in light of what you said this morning, Inspector Hayes, it appears that uh, the, the touchstone of your considerations when you were preparing that report were some of the aspects of Regulation 5.3.23. Um, did, did you make a considered decision about which, a, which aspects of that regulation to um, put the document through the filter of, um, or uh, are those that you identified as the most important? What was your decision-making process? Uh, in relation to the questions, is that what, what you're asking? Yes, well, by way of example, at attachment two, yep. which is this verification report, at page 33 thereof, there are a set of questions, mm -hmm. some of which are based on topics mm -hmm. and others um, trail off into a reference to a particular subsection of a particular regulation. I just want to know, in formulating those questions, is it because those were the ones that you identified as bearing the most significance or importance, <coughs> or is it because you have a predetermined way that you assess um, the compliance of safety assessments? I can't answer that question wholly because the questions are developed via a senior mining engineer that gives us the tool to then go and ask the questions out in the field. Mm -hmm. However, I guess an analysis of, as I said before, past incidents, history, um, incident, uh, injury trends, everything that goes into a verification then get filtered down to some level and, for instance, the first, first line, the SMS contains a description. I guess what we're looking for there is, is that there is a direct link between the safety assessment and the safety management system. So they're, they're in relation to each other. It then starts drilling a little bit further down into the identified major mining hazard being mine fires. And then we start going further into some of those areas there. So we don't necessarily look at the beginning of each 
um, regulation from start to finish and see whether yes. that complies with every aspect of that note. It's, it would be a long process to do something like that. But question five, um, if we can move mm -hmm. down a little bit, question five in that set, or item five, says evidence that the safety assessment, I assume that's the, um, the acronym you say refers to that, has provided a detailed understanding of all aspects of risk from mine fires, mm -hmm. regulation 5.3.232, i.e. is there evidence they understand the main causes of the mine fires and the preventative and mitigative controls? Um, I suggest, Inspector Hayes, that um, although it's not uh, presumably intended to wrap up all the obligations mm -hmm. under the regulation, that is an attempt to identify the heart of the matter, and that is, do they know what the risks are and have they got proper preventative or mitigative controls in place? That's correct. Is there any guidance material that um, you or, or uh, WorkSafe have prepared for um, operators of mines covered by Regulation 5.3.23 or a template uh, to populate dealing with the matters in subsection C, D and E that you've been asked about a number of times? Not that I'm aware of that. No. All right. And in, uh, in your work with the mine, and I think you said um, when you first started being asked questions today that you visit once or twice a month over, over a year and for various different reasons, in all your visits you haven't identified a failure to comply with Regulation 5.3.23, subsections 4, C, D and E that you've been taken to today. That is correct. When you issued an improvement notice, you were also asked about that this morning, the 2012 improvement notice pertaining to safety assessment, assessments, and then returned to check compliance in October 2012, you were asked what was given to you. And if I understood correctly, you said I was given um, the document with the bow tie chart populated with risks, and there may be a question about its printout date, but you were given one in October 2012. And were you also given, um, in hard copy form, or given access to the control description sheets That's that correct. you've been asked about? All right. Can I ask, Inspector Hayes, in, in looking at those documents, did you also um, look at, at that time, the 2009 report that I just took you to this morning? Not in conjunction, no. Were you aware of it by that time? Are we just for... Clarity, we're looking at this report again for 2009. Yes. yes, we were aware of it, yeah. I, I think it's actually referred to in either the compliance notice or the improvement notice. Improvement notice, notice not? that's correct. It, yes, because if we notice. look at the um, the compliance document, um, the document that the compliance notice at attachment 20 that can be brought up. And at page two of that document although it's got 120 written at the bottom of it. See the paragraph that says, during my visit, I observed a document titled International Power Hazelwood Report 4, etc. That's, that's the very document I was taking you to this morning. That's right. Isn't it? Right. Yeah. So when you formed a view that there had been compliance, I take it that you had in mind a number of things. You had in mind a standard you were measuring compliance against. Yes? What... I was looking at com measuring compliance against was those deficiencies that were identified in that in your own notice and the uh, report there that said further works. Okay. Yeah. And in asking yourself the question, have the deficiencies been remedied? You looked at the 2009 report I'll, that we just referred to. I'll clarify to. that we did not look at that on the eighth <coughs> of eighth of October. Those first few paragraphs talk about what I observed on the 21st of June. Yes. And then you but will look further down, yes. then it says, today I met with, yep. and then they describe the processes and then what we observed, obviously. Yeah. All I'm asking, Mr Hayes, is in looking at the uh, bow tie diagram and the mm -hmm. hundreds of pages of mm -hmm. control descriptor sheets, no doubt you also had in mind your own knowledge of the process which had preceded it, namely the 2009 workshops. That's correct. And the report that you'd seen back in July. That's correct. And when you attended in October in order to check compliance, you were given the bow tie diagram, the mm -hmm. hundreds of control sheets, and access to minutes from That's October. Good. And those minutes were shown to you this morning, and no doubt that gave you the opportunity to uh, remind yourself about what those um, referred to. 
but they identified that on the 4th and 5th of October, a proposed a working party at the mine had undertaken the further work identified yeah. Yeah. in the December 09 report. Is that right? That's correct. And so it was the combination of all of those things which led you to issue the compliance notice? Well, to, yeah, to lift the notice and, and state that they have complied with that, yes. Yes. Now, you've said a number of times that when you were checking compliance, you were checking it against your own improvement notice, mm -hmm. which makes sense. But I take it that if along the way you've noticed some other deficiency in compliance with the regulations that apply to major mines, you would have issued another improvement notice. Look, if, yes, absolutely. If those deficiencies were obvious and obvious to me through my own knowledge, then absolutely, or we would mm. not have given them compliance with the original notice. Yes. Yeah. And the matters that Mr Rosen has taken you to this morning, compliance with subsection C, D and E, were not obvious to you at the time, were they? They're matters that have been brought to your attention today. That's correct. been asked some questions this morning about a much later improvement notice, the one issued in March this year. It's attachment 27, if we can go back to that briefly. When you were asked some questions about this improvement notice, just waiting for it to come up, but just to orient you, Inspector Hayes, it's the 20th of March 1 and um, you were asked about the circumstances in which you came to be in at the mine prior to the formal end of the fire. Uh, you were asked some questions about how you gleaned knowledge about the fire that had occurred. Um, I, I assume that that's only intended to be a high-level summary from those that you met with um, on the occasions you entered during or um, during the tail end of the fire, and not intended to be a statement in some sort of investigatory sense of the causes of the fire. Are we referring now to page two again? Um, Oh, I think Mr Rosen looking. took you to some statements about what people at, at the site had oh, told that's you. in the entry report. Right. Yeah. Oh, that might be in the previous attachment. Yeah. I apologise. Yeah. Yeah, on page two. Management informed WorkSafe that burning embers entered into the mine around midday. That's correct. All right. Um, the, uh, what I'm just suggesting to Inspector Hayes is that that summary there <coughs> is by way of high-level summary or background and not intended, <coughs> excuse me, in a, in a formal sense, to identify a view on behalf of the regulator as to the causes of this fire. At this point in time, it's that statement there is GDF Sewer's view. Something on, you were told on the day? That's right. Okay. And in terms of how this report reads, that's the uh, background information that you gleaned, but not a conclusion by you that this is a correct indication of the cause. That's correct. Right. Now, um, you then explained that you issued an improvement notice pertaining to a fire break and that in doing so, your standard for compliance was GDF sewers policy with respect to the width of that fire break. The width and the process involved in maintaining that fire break, yes. Okay. Now, um, the time for compliance with that notice hasn't passed yet. It will fall due on the 23rd of That's June. And uh, do, do you uh, understand that GDF Sewers has uh, obtained, uh, has commenced the process of having excavators and, and works worth at work, earthworks machinery available in order to attend to those matters? I have been informed that some of those processes are, are under review and that they were beginning to take place, yes. Right. But not, not to the detail that you've just provided there. And the issue was, wasn't it, that your concern was inspired by, in some places, the height of the grass, but in other places, issues to do with more dense vegetation That's that you correct. said should now be removed. All right. 
and you'll check that on or about the 23rd of June. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, more broadly about the question of, of dealing with in particular grass in terms of vegetation. During your visits to the mine over time, have you become aware of the annual slashing program that the mine conducts um, around the perimeter of the mine? I have been made aware of it through these inquiries. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, are you, uh, I don't know whether you've been made aware of the evidence that Mr Dugan gave earlier in this inquiry where he referred to the slashing program? No, I'm not aware of that. All right, can I ask that the witness just be shown one document? It's a single page map and I have lots of spare copies available. Under summons, but what I'm learning is that that doesn't mean that it gets anywhere. <clears throat> I'm not suggesting, Inspector Hayes, that you've seen this before, but it's just a handy way to, to tackle the topic. Um, you said you've been made aware through these inquiries. I wasn't quite sure whether you meant learning about the work of this inquiry or because of your more frequent attendance recently at the mine. The latter, yes. Okay. Um, and through those attendances, have you been made aware that the mine sets out an annual program that covers the summer season? Um, and this is by way of example, although this is the document that pertains to 2013-2014. It maps out an area that it will slash in a particular way or deal with to the level of fine mulch, etc. In a, in a way depicted in this programmatic map with colours and um, distances. Are you now aware that that's the approach adopted? That is the process that they have set out. If that's correct, then that is correct, yes, but I'm aware of that now. Um, the tribunal pleases, can this document be dealt with in the same way as previously? Um, this is document 2.02 produced by us under summons in the first week of May. Um, this witness can't identify it, I just wanted him to ask to answer questions about it. I'd seek to tender it. If, if that uh, is not the disposition of the board, I'd ask that it be marked for identification and I'll have someone formally prove it later. Um, Finally, Inspector Hayes, I asked you a moment ago about that little passage in the entry report about what you were told about embers and, mm -hmm. the, and the fire. And Mr Rosen also asked you about whether your improvement notice with respect to the fire break was best characterised as forward-looking, looking at future risk. Can I just draw the threads of that together and ask you, um, you're not suggesting, are you, that the status in which you found the fire break has been found by you to have been a contributing <coughs> cause to the spread of the fire in February this year. I'd ask if you can break that down again. Just, yeah. Are you asking that was the fire break a cause? Is that, is that a conclusion you've reached? No. I have no further questions for Inspector Hayes. <coughs> Uh, Inspector, you were asked about uh, Regulation 5.3.2, which is a list of uh, uh, mining hazards. Uh, it was put to you that uh, it included uh, not only uh, employees and contractors, but people living nearby. You agreed with that? That's correct. Um, does, that, uh, does that arise, when, when you say it includes people living nearby, does that arise out of Section 23 of the Occupation Health and Safety Act? Through the conduct of the employers undertaken, that is correct. Yes, well, that's what I was going to put to you. The Section 23 um, employs that term, doesn't it? Um, it's, not, it's not in a general sense providing protection for members of the public. Um, it's only providing protection for members of the public for risks arising out of the conduct of the duty holders undertaking. That's correct. Um, similarly, Section 2 of the Act, uh, the, the, object, uh, the object of the Act, again refers to members of the public re risk but again, is that only in relation to the conduct of the undertaking? Um, is that to be contrasted against uh, Section 21? Section 21 is the main section creating obligations on the employer in relation to its employees. Is that right? Yes. Section 21 doesn't employ that phrase, does it? The conduct of the undertaking. 
No, it doesn't. No. In fact, uh, the phrase that, that Section 21 uses is the risks... Uh, um, uh, it talks about creating um, uh, a, a working environment which is safe and without risks. That's correct. Uh, but doesn't employ that, that expression from the conduct of the undertaking. No. So it's broader in, in the sense in relation in, in, in the sense of an employer's obligations to its employees. It's broader, isn't it? Than just the conduct of its undertaking. Yes, that is correct. It, it's broader than the offence created by Section 23. That's correct. Uh, because uh, where uh, the risk relates to a member of the public, uh, it must arise from the conduct of the undertaking. That's correct. Yes. <clears throat> You're asked um, uh, questions about uh, major mining hazards. Um, that's that's uh, a broad definition which requires um, the risk to be at such a level that uh, it, it uh, could lead to more than one death. Yes, that's correct. Does that mean that um, fire isn't always to be considered a major mining hazard uh, in all parts of the mine? Does it depend on the circumstances? Correct. Um, you're asked a lot of questions about the safety, uh, the, the uh, improvement notice which you held to be complied with. Um, were you conducting an assessment of uh, the duty holder's ability to conduct a safety assessment generally, or were you only assessing whether the safety notice had, the improvement notice had been complied with? Yes, the latter. To assess, or to ensure that the notice had been complied with. That's a more limited task That's correct. than conducting uh, an assessment of their, their ability to conduct a safety assessment generally? generally, and compliance with all those regulations, that's correct. Uh, and, and I won't spend much time on this because my learned friend, Ms Doyle, already has, but is it the case that when you are making an assessment about whether the, the improvement notice has been complied with, you're not only relying on the documents you look at that day, is that right? That's correct. You're also relying on um, your broad experience. That's correct. And you're relying on the interactions you've had with the duty holder in the past. Yes. Uh, and, and indeed, issuing a safety improvement notice is not the first step adopted at any stage, is it? No. Um, it always follows consultation with the duty holder? That's correct. Yeah. And this, this is effectively in line with Section 7 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act that deals with the functions of the VWA, because one of your roles is to, uh, under uh, subsection H, is to foster a cooperative and, consult and consultative relationship between the employer and its employees. That is, is that correct. right? That is correct, yes. yes. Thank you. They're the questions I have. No re-examination for Mr Hayes. Could he please be excused? Sorry, just before no. you do, Mr Hayes. Sorry, I nearly got away, Mr Hayes. Almost. Um, Mr Hayes, just drawing, I guess, together um, the inquiry is looking into the future and how can, how can things like this be prevented? Um, so just to summarise, Ms White yesterday gave us um, clear evidence that the mine regulator regulates the you know, parts of, of the mine and that the Victorian Work Cover Authority um, regulate um, in relation to safety. Um, but my understanding is that, it's, that, that the VWA regulate in relation to fire in the mine. That's, is that your a correct summary? Or? Do you, can you go back a bit? Just... So there are two regulators in relation to um, the Hazelwood Mine Fire and other large open cut mines. The Department of Sustainability. Jurisdictions, That's yes, right. Yeah. And so Victoria and Work Covers jurisdiction or authority is in relation to safety, but um, particularly fires in the mine. We've been talking about that this morning. I would go back and say the primary is the safety of employees, whether it's fires or any, <coughs> any other issue there. So the regulatory boundaries, I think, is something that maybe um, Mr Neist or someone else may be able to answer with regards to that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I hope that answers the question. So, fire, fire protection is under the remit of the Victorian Work Cover Authority. Where it concerns the risk to health and safety of employees. Okay, thank you. So, looking forward, and I guess examining the incident that took place on the 9th of February and the 45 days following, have you had any opportunity for reflection on things that perhaps Victorian Work Cover Authority may have done differently? Or, or would do differently in the future? Well, we, look, we're, VWA is still uh, conducting inquiries with the site there. Um, 
other things that we'll do differently. We still predominantly look at the risk to health and safety of employees, regardless, again, whether it's fires or whether it's plant stability or batter stability or whatever the case may be. And VWA would obviously have to allocate resources into those areas. So, yes, I think there would be some type of review that um, Earth Resources and VWA would undertake. And do you think, um, are you proposing that a jurisdiction review would also take place? Is, is that Mr Neese's that, jurisdiction? That probably more so for that, yeah. Well, I guess you're in the, you're at the coal face, to so pardon to the use of the pun. Yes, exactly. Is there any, um, is there any things that you see might be um, subject to examination for further improvement, so in terms of the jurisdiction or...? Um, Again, look, that would that obviously... Earth resources, the processes that, that we set out would obviously be reviewed. There's no doubt about that at some point. Um, whether improvements can be made, it would come out through that review there, yeah. And how does a review take, take place at BWA? A review of the field operations, for example, the processes that we're going through. I, I guess the team would come together and, and discuss those issues that are raised and obviously any findings from the board that would form part of that review. It would then flow on through to the other, to VWA hierarchy, and that would be management through to Mr Neeson and so on, I would imagine. All right. Thank you very much for your time, Mr Hayes. Thank you, Mr Hayes. Mr. Sorry to interrupt, Mr Rosen. Can I be heard briefly on a matter relating to documents that have been uh, mentioned in dispatches this morning? I just wanted to clarify the situation. The inquiry served my client with a summons on the 29th of April requiring production of documents in 18 categories. We provided those documents on the 9th of May and uh, by dint of the number of topics asked for, the documents produced ran to eight Lever Arch folders. This morning... Documents falling under paragraphs 11, 12 and 14 have been dealt with, in, at least in part, by witnesses. Uh, with respect to paragraph 11, this is the document sometimes referred to in other uh, in witness statements like that of uh, uh, Professor Cliff as the tab 26 document. That is the document, as I understand it, that's been made exhibit 66 today. It's tab 10 in exhibit 66, a bow tie document with uh, hundreds of pages of control descriptors. The documents referred to in paragraph 12 are the um, GHD interim report of December 2009 that I tended through this witness this morning and the minutes of a working party review from October 2012 that Mr Rosen tended through this witness. The documents in paragraph 14 hark back to 2004 and the tribunal might recall that those are the documents I asked this witness about, but of course he has no direct knowledge of. I just wanted to flag that these documents have been uh, provided since the first week of May. Uh, we didn't appreciate till today the way in which they were going to be deployed or used, and we have no difficulty with that, but I want a fair opportunity to complete the record. And in order to do that, I will want to tender the 2004 documents. Uh, Mr Harkins has already given evidence three times, and he is the one who touched on these matters, and it wasn't uh, put to him that any of the documents in these three categories were deficient or would be the subject of later criticism. So I just wanted to um, set out the sequence of events in terms of where these documents come from and for how long they've been available and our intention to now get multiple copies of the ones in category 14, namely a suite of four reports from 2004, which are the starting point of a consideration of safety assessments. And at an appropriate time, it may be later today or tomorrow, I will seek to tender those because I now apprehend that they'll be important in terms of, among other things, questions that will need to be asked of Professor Cliff. And without that full suite of documents, it'll be inefficient but also unfair for GDF sewers to proceed without the full suite before the tribunal. Just wanted to flag that's our intention in terms of now getting that set of four documents together and ready. Uh, rather than here in relation to this matter, that you have a liaison to work out what's appropriate. Yes. And if you can get agreement, then it's easy. If not, then uh, we need to perhaps review the position. But I can understand what you're saying. I'll just briefly respond to that, but uh, first, perhaps, poor Mr. Hayes. Oh, yeah, Mr. Hayes. I'm wondering why he has to be part of the audience. If he yeah. could be excused. Um, uh, we have no general difficulty with what's been raised by my learned friend, but I should just place on record uh, two matters. One is a practical issue that, in accordance with the practice note, 
if council assisting can be informed in advance of documents that uh, that other council want to rely upon, then we'll make sure that they're available and, and on the system and so on. Um, a more substantive issue is, without wanting to trawl over the history, um, the inquiry has sought from GDF Sewers a statement, this was the initial request, a statement from either Mr Graham or Mr Gary Wilkinson identifying principal plans and policies for mitigating fire risk. Now, as far as we're aware, in the statements that have been provided on behalf of GDF Sewers to the inquiry, only Mr Harkins' second statement deals with that matter, and that's in paragraphs 32 to 34, and he doesn't attach any of the documents. So that's, that's the position. Um, but uh, I will take up the Learned Chair's observation that we discuss the matter. And, and I think that I think that's ultimately uh, the appropriate way is. Thank you. Um, the next witness is Mr. Neist. I call Mr. Lynn Neist. Please raise the Bible and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. To this board of inquiry. To this board of inquiry. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Neist. Um, can you confirm for us that your full name is Leonard James Neist? That's correct. Uh, Mr. Neist, you are the Executive Director Health and Safety in the Executive Director Division of the Victorian Work Cover Authority. Yes, that's right. And for the purposes of the inquiry, you have made a uh, statement dated the 23rd of May 2014, which is a statement of some 44 paragraphs and has three attachments. Is that right? That's right. And have you had an opportunity to read through the statement before coming along giving evidence today? Yes, I have. And is there anything in the statement that you would like to change? Yes, there's just two small minor amendments or yes. corrections on page five. Uh, at the bottom of the page, uh, there's a statement that says, I talk about this process. Well, that's, that's an error that needs to be crossed out. Um, just that last sentence that says, I talk about this process below. So you, you'd seek to delete the to last sentence delete in last paragraph sentence. 21? Yes, thank you. And then on page 6, again at the bottom of the page, uh, currently reads, that is likely to result from mining hazards. That should be result from major mining hazards. Uh, so we're looking at the... Last sentence on the bottom of page six commences with however. Oh yes, I see the sentence. And third the last sentence. line, uh, last line is that is likely to result from mining hazards. That yes. should be major mining hazards. Okay, so we're in the second line at the top of page seven and you okay. would insert the word major between from and mining. Yes. Thank you. With those two changes being made, are the contents of the statement true and correct? Yes, they are. I'll turn to the statement, please. Yes, <coughs> there'll be exhibit 70. Thank you. Now, Mr Neist, um, you've only recently been appointed to your role within WorkCover in January of this year? That's correct. And uh, before that, as uh, you explain on page two of your statement, top of page two, a series of dot points, <coughs> You've held a number of positions, most recently as the Chief Executive at the New South Wales Independent Transport Safety Regulator. Yes. And I see that was a job you managed to do whilst also holding a position in Abu Dhabi. Yes, I was uh, providing the Department of Transport in Abu Dhabi with services around security and risk as they wrote their new surface transport laws. OK. Um, prior to that, you held a number of positions relating to safety and risk management, if I can use that general descriptor. Um, and preceding all of that, you spent 20 years in the RAAF Department of Defence. That's correct. What 
what responsibilities um, come with the position of Executive Director Health and Safety at the Work Cover Authority? Principally, it's responsible for the workforce uh, required to deliver and ensure compliance with the OHS Act and the other uh, the other acts that VWA concerns itself with, but predominantly it's the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Uh, so I'm accountable for managing the, the structure, putting in place uh, leadership and executive direction uh, for that workforce. You've not previously worked for an Occupational Health and Safety Regulator. That's a fair observation, isn't it? That's correct. Um, and uh, you set out in on the first page of your statement the qualifications you have, which include a Bachelor of Engineering Mechanical and a Master of Science Logistics Management, as well as a number of other um, qualifications that you set out there. Um, the fourth dot point I want to ask you about, Health and Safety Investigator, Safety Wise Australia. What, what, um, what is that qualification? What did that involve? That, that is, in fact, an OH&S uh, investigator. So uh, in, in the process of, of uh, improving my professional knowledge, I, I did a the ICAM, which is another uh, OHS investigation process, as a lead investigator. Oh, yes. And then, as a to follow up on that, uh, as part of that same process, I did a uh, it was a, a short course on OHS, particular to do with OHS investigations and looking at the, the particularly the employee health and safety aspects of a, a major incident investigation. You said it was a short course. What, what, what was the duration of those two courses? Firstly, the ICAM process. ICAM process uh, was a four-day course. Yes. Uh, the Health and Safety Investigator Safety Wise uh, was a three-day course. Um, and uh, did I understand you to be saying you did those as part of your preparation for taking on this role? or No, just no? Part, of, part of my own professional development. Right. Um, to, I, I searched in vain on the work cover website for a um, an organisational chart, um, and I know we didn't ask you specifically for one, Mr. Neist. Um, but uh, to whom do you answer? I report to the chief executive of the VWA. Okay, so that executive director division. I take it there are several executive directors. Yes, there, are there? There's how an many... executive leadership team of which I'm a member. And how many are there in that team? At the, currently, there's. I said it's new to me, I've got to recount them up, so one, two, three, six, six uh, personnel. You're, you're one of six executive directors, the others obviously head up... Um, the chief financial officer, the, uh, there's also uh, the head, of, head executive director of the insurance business unit within VWA. Yes, I see. Um, so you effectively head up the prevention <coughs> enforcement arm of the VWA in relation to the Occupational Health and Safety That's Act. You say that answering to you or you're responsible for 450 field officers, investigators, work site technical experts and support staff. Is that 450 in total of those various people or is it 450 field officers and then... The, the 450 um, is, is the workforce for the VWA. So those, the investigators don't report to me directly. So reporting directly to, through my organisational is... Um, 320 uh, personnel. So that's the field officers, that's, that's a management structure, um, administrative staff, all required for, for the delivery of those, prevent, as you said, preventive compliance and enforcement services. Right. Just so the inquiry has an understanding of where you sit relative, say, to Mr Hayes, does Mr Hayes' as boss, Mr Kelly, is he a direct report to you? No, he's not. So one of the reasons, even if you had have asked for an organisational charter, it probably would have been difficult to provide since January, there's been a major reorganisation structure of, of the unit that I'm responsible for. Right. And, and that was one of the reasons I was brought on to, to put that organisational change into effect. So reporting to me, I have four direct reports. Um, two of those direct reports are responsible for the operational delivery of the preventative services in the field. Yes. And reporting to one of those direct reports is a, a director of hazardous industries. And reporting to that director is, is uh, Mr Rob Kelly. Right. So other hazardous industries that would fall under that area would include the regulation of major hazard facilities, I That's take correct. it? Yes. Right. 
that would be headed up by someone at Mr Kelly's level. level. Is yes, that right? Manager. Thank you. Thank you. I understand from your statement that despite um, only commencing at the VWA in January of this year, um, you have responded to the various questions that were asked of you uh, in the letter from Ms Stanson, legal advisor to the inquiry, uh, by making inquiries of other relevant people within the organisation. That's correct. Yes. Um, I don't know if you were present in the inquiry hearing room yesterday when Ms White was giving evidence? No, but I reviewed there? the transcript last night. Okay. Um, you probably would have noted in your review that Ms White was asked on, I think, more than one occasion who the regulator was that was responsible for managing the risk of fire in worked out batters of the Hazelwood mine. So I'm asking a very specific question in relation to the mine that's the subject of this inquiry. Um, do you agree with the answer she gave to the inquiry that the VWA is the regulator responsible for the management of that risk? Short answer is yes. The, the complexity of the question, though, is in response to which exact risk of fire. So um, I'm the responsible for the Occupational Health and Safety Act enforcement. So in terms of the risk of fire constituting or representing a hazard or, or a... a a chance of harm to both the employees in the workplace or to persons as a result of the conduct of the undertaking, then yes, I'm the regulator for fire in the, in the mines. But if there's a fire in the mine that exposes people, the general public, outside of the mine, and it cannot be said that the risk arises from the conduct of the undertaking of the mine, then you, your position, as I understand it, is that's not work covers uh, jurisdiction, if that's I can put it that way. Um, and uh, necessarily begs the next question, whose jurisdiction is it? Again, it comes down to what risk is being presented to, to the public. So the, the risk, risk to the community of Morwell was a consequence of a fire in a mine. Yes. Um, so if you're asking who needs to regulate for public safety and health in terms of the consequences of a fire in a, in a major technological uh, disaster or event such as this, um, that's a combination of regulators because it, once, once the event has, has reached the proportion that it is now imposing a threat or a risk to a community surrounding that t technological undertaking, uh, then emergency <laughs> services are involved. Uh, if it's an environmental impact, then the EPA are involved. So it's a, the regulators have to work in a coordinated fashion to ensure that the that, that, that considerations of that event are, consider, are understood. I understand that, but the emergency services and the EPA and other such agencies only become involved when the risk manifests itself into an incident, do they not? That's correct. And I'm asking you at this point of the regulation of the risk, if you understand the nature of the question. The re probably more probably the regulation of the hazard. Yes. Because it's the hazard that then results in, in, in the, the issue. Um, right now, I, if we're talking about the hazard presented by a fire in a mine yes. to the community that surrounds that mine, Yes. That is not a result, direct result of the conduct of the undertaking by that mine. Then I'm not too sure who should be regulating that. There may be a gap. There may. Short answer: Yes, there may be. If if we're talking about public safety as a result of something that is not a result of the conduct of an undertaking, I, I personally am not sure who should be regulating that or who's accountable for that public safety regulation. And what if it's partly, what if it's partly the operation of the enterprise and only partly? So in, in, in hindsight, uh, because of the event that's occurred in this mine, um, when we consider what's gone in the past about the hazard of fire in the mine, as, as we've heard in the discussions uh, one of my inspectors, 
they, they draw a critical line between a major mining hazard versus a mining hazard. And the concern in terms of occupational health and safety is around major mining hazards because they present a real and present danger to loss of life or, or significant death, um, more than one life. In looking in hindsight, I don't think it was ever foreseen that a, a fire in the disused portions of this mine would ever present such a hazard to the town of Morwell, even though you, everyone would say, well, it is so close to the mine, why wouldn't you have thought of that? History says in the fires that have persisted in the past, it's never presented in this way. In hindsight now, though, as the OHS regulator and that, with oversight of this mine, I now have to consider that there is the probability of such a consequence. And so I have to turn my mind to asking the duty holder what they are doing to control that consequence in the future. So I guess if you're asking, is there a gap in regulation that would prevent us getting on top of this issue? I don't, I don't believe so. I believe the regulations and the, the law that I currently employ under the OHS Act provides me with sufficient tools to then go back to this duty holder and say, we are now aware that a, mine, a fire anywhere in the mine, if it gets to a certain extent and scale, does present a risk to the community, particularly given the community is so close to this mine. So I will be asking the duty holder to assess that risk and present to me the controls that they were willing to put in place to prevent that risk, so far as is originally practical. Have you asked that question? Not at this stage, no. Um, it's, it's, it, can I answer? It's, it's not a simple, quick question. It's a matter of setting up a process um, moving forward, the, ma ma the Earth Resources Group are focused on, on mines, they're focused on uh, quarries. I intend in the future to bolster their, their resources when inquiring into situations like this with some, some good, strong system safety experts that the VWA has, a, has in, their, in their team, so that the inquiry is no longer just what are you doing about an issue with a mine, it's about what are you doing systematically to look at the hazard that's presented as a result of the conduct of your undertaking and the close proximity of this community to this mine? I suppose my practical reason for asking questions is do we include a recommendation that there may or may not be a gap? Uh, the recommendation is that if there is a gap, it be filled. If, if there can be a, a distinct gap between regulatory accountability and responsibility for the public safety of a community that that resides alongside a, a technology undertaking and the risks that that technology or undertaking presents to that community just by its existence, that, then that, that gap should be filled. In. To understand in a practical way, Mr Neist, whether there's a gap and what the gap might look like, as you sit there now, is it WorkCover's view that this fire did arise from the conduct of the undertaking of the operator of the Hazelwood mine? No. It's WorkCover's view that it did not arise? It, it did not arise because of the conduct of the undertaking. The, the undertaking is to extract brown coal from the earth and transport the brown coal to a power station. There is nothing in that conduct that caused this fire. I don't want to get into a debate with you about the interpretation of Section 23 of the OHS Act and the case law on it, um, but uh, and this may be this may be semantics, but Section 23 is concerned with risks arising from the conduct of the undertaking of the employer, and you say work covers position is that the risk which manifested on the 9th of February does not meet that description. Which risk are we, are we talking about? Are we Are talking about the risk of fire or the risk of an environmental impact on the community of Morwell? Both. Both. The, the risk of fire didn't present itself as a result of the conduct of the undertaking. Did the outcome of the fire uh, arise from the conduct of the undertaking? In, I'll, in, I'll, I'll in be hindsight, specific. Yes, I understand what you're saying. So in, in, in hindsight, the... The, the simplest way to put it is that if the mine wasn't there with exposed brown coal, then we wouldn't have had the event that we had. Yes. So is the conduct of the undertaking that there is exposed brown coal there? 
Well, you're, what you're now, now descending to is, is a level of complexity which seems to contradict the very simple answer you gave a moment ago, <laughs> yes. which was a simple no, is the position this, Mr Neese, that we know there's an investigation being conducted by WorkCover in relation to this fire. Yes. We know that from Mr Watson's statement. I know that's a different section from WorkCover to you. We yes. know that. Uh, isn't that one of the very things that that investigation will be considering, whether or not this event falls within Section 23 of the Act? The purpose of the investigation will is to see if there's been a breach of the Act. Yes. And has the duty holder been negligent in any way in, in account of the OHS Act? And you can only breach an Act if it applies to you. So that's, that's the correct. thing that has to be considered in the investigation. Correct. You're not suggesting to the inquiry that that's a decision that's already been made in advance of the investigation being completed? No. No. Right. So what, what I was suggesting to the inquiry that in, in my, account, my accountability is prevention of these things. So I have a, now have the knowledge that a, a likely outcome of a fire in a disused portion of this mine is, is the impact on the town of Morwell. So in terms of my preventative strategies, I have to think about how can I prevent that from occurring again. It's not my judgment whether the duty holder did or didn't or was negligent in the OHS Act. That's why you have an investigation. But it's my duty to prevent these things from happening if I can. Um, is it the northern batters of the mine that you refer to as being a disused part of the mine? Yes. Why do you refer to it as disused? The un as I said, the undertaking is to, to extract the brown coal and transport it to, to the power station. Yes. Uh, that activity no longer goes on on the northern batters. But you understand, and certainly there's been a great deal of evidence at this inquiry, that there are a number of crucial pieces of infrastructure that are located on the northern batters. I, I didn't say that the northern batters wasn't a workplace. Yes. It's not part of the direct undertaking of the mine. It's a workplace because there's reticulation of water services, there's pumping systems, there's drainage systems. They have to have to uh, work on the, that area. There's roads, so people go there from time to time. So it is a workplace, but it is not the undertaking of the mine. Um, and without dwelling on this issue of uh, the complexity of Section 23 of the OHS Act, um, if the inquiry was satisfied, for example that a reduction in the availability of reticulated water in the vicinity of the northern batters contributed to the extent of the fire, the length of time it took to put it out, then that could bring it under Section 23, could it not? The part of the conduct of the undertaking is having available reticulated water um, in the event that there's an emergency. The, the requirement for the fire protection, uh, as far as OHS law and, and my inspectors is, is in protecting the work, the workplace. So, because that, as you said, this from time to time there are workers in those in those areas. There has to be sufficient protection for those workers. So, a standby water tanker could provide that protection uh, of a worker working on a pump or, or a drainage system. In, in terms of the actual working faces of the mine, that's why there's more complex spraying systems and. and and more, uh, more present fire protection systems because they have to to protect the workplace. So if I haven't answered your question, I may not have completely understood the question. No, that's all right. Thank you. Um, now, you said a moment ago that it had never been foreseen, though were the words I've written down, that a fire in, um, of this type... Of this no, I didn't say type, that. No, no, let the, me finish, the, sorry, but, Mr Neese. Please yeah. let me finish the yes, question. Please. You can tell me if I've got it wrong, but only when I've finished it. It's never been foreseen that a fire could impact on the town of Morwell in this way, a fire in the non-working part of the mine. Um, do you mean never foreseen by you personally? Never foreseen by work cover? What, what do you mean? By the duty holder. By duty of sewers? Yes. <coughs> they're, 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 the, they're the person responsible for defining the hazards, assessing the risks and putting in place the controls for those risks. Um, are you referring to the absence of any consideration of this risk from the safety assessment, the evidence that we've heard this morning? Is that how you say, the basis of you saying that Sa they haven't seen it? Sorry. The safety assessment is applied to major mining hazards. Yes. So a fire in the, in the disused portion of the mine is not considered to be a major mining hazard, so therefore it doesn't come under a safety assessment. Do you say that a fire in the, what you're referring to as the disused part of the 
mine, so let's be specific, the Northern Batters, you say such a fire is a mining hazard. Well, there's no doubt it's a mining hazard. I think we can all agree on that. But you say it is not a mining hazard that has the potential to cause an incident that would cause or pose a significant risk of causing more than one death. Now, that, that's the position the duty holder has made, and we have no information to contradict or question that position. Take a simple example, Mr Neist. A fire in the worked-out batters could cause a batter collapse, couldn't it, that could uh, seriously endanger the lives of firefighters in the vicinity? Definitely it could, but the, the, the duty holder has explained that the batter collapse happens in such a fashion that there would be sufficient time to evacuate the area. I'm just trying to understand this. Um, you're saying that the duty holder, just so we're all clear, that's GDF, GDF Sewers, Sewers yes. um, has not assessed that a mine fire in the worked out part of the mine is a major mining... That's correct. ..major mining hazard. That's correct. And are you merely making that observation or are you endorsing from work cover's perspective that that's a correct... Uh, categorisation of the risk. Just want to understand where you stand on that. So, the G GDF sewers, the duty holder, has presented that as their, their risk assessment of the operation of the mine, and the VWA has not challenged that risk assessment in any way. If, if we considered that that was wrong, we would have issued a, an improvement notice or a prohibition notice or some other, some other discussion with the duty holder if we thought it was critically wrong. When you say GDF have done that, what do you mean? Excuse me. Um, when you say GDF sewers have done that, what, what are you referring to specifically? Is that the safety assessment that we've been examining today when, with Mr Hayes? Is that the source document for your it's sa observation? It's safety management system. Yes. Um, their, their, their assessment presentation of risks. Um, and, and it's not just GDF sewers. It's the... The regulations say that fire is a mining hazard. It's only that additional analysis that says it has the probability or likelihood of a significant, a significant risk to endanger life of more than one person that it then kicks over into that major mining hazard regime. Right now, in, in, the, in the operation of mines in Victoria, other than directly involved in the workplace where miners, the employees, are, are involved, there hasn't been a suggestion that that kicks that over, that there is that significant risk of loss of one or more lives to do with fires in, in, in non-working parts of the mine. So it's not just the GDF sewers, the duty holder. That's the experience of the, of the earth resources industry. So you say because it hasn't happened, therefore there's no risk? Is that... No, right? there's no such thing as zero risk. I'm not saying because it happened, hasn't happened there's no risk, but I'm saying the risk isn't sufficient that, so far as is reasonably practical, you would expect someone to deploy resources, expend finances on correcting a thing when they have so many other risks that are, are far, present a far bigger risk. So it's, it's, it's about getting the right balance of where the resources are deployed to achieve the best outcome for safety in the workplace. Um, I think we've exhausted the debate about whether or not it's a major mining hazard. Perhaps we can agree to disagree. But even if it's just a mining hazard, let's, let's accept that. Yes. Um, the responsibility of the duty holder is the same in substance, isn't it? They still have to do what's reasonably practicable Practical. to address the risk. Correct. The additional requirements, if it's a major mining hazard, are the requirements we looked at earlier today, that is the documented safety assessment and the like. That's correct. But they're procedural. The substantive obligation is still to control the risk so far as is reasonably practicable. Correct. Is that right? All right. Perhaps we'll come back to that. Um, but before... Uh, I should have asked you about this a moment ago. Um, I should ask you about the memorandum of understanding that you attach to your statement on the question that uh, you were asked by the learned chairman earlier. So if you go behind tab one of your statement, please. We heard some evidence from uh, Ms White about this yesterday. Uh, at paragraph 1.2 on... So we have an MOU and then a schedule attached to the MOU. Is that right? That's right. 
Sorry, I want to ask you about the schedule. We can go to page one of the schedule, which is the document that ends in 0006 in the top right hand corner. Do you have uh, the first page of the schedule in front of you? Yes, I do. Um, we understand that the table there identifies areas of, of overlapping responsibilities between what we referred to as WorkSafe, but we now know as the VWA, and uh, and even though it says DPI, we know that's a DS, <laughs> DSDBI. Yeah. It just shows how names change in the public service. Um, you've explained that even though the uh, expiry date of this MOU has been has been reached, it, it remains extant until it's replaced by something Correct. else. Um, in the box there we see uh, an identification of safety related elements and then the identification of the lead and the support agency. It's the first two lines I want to ask you about. There's a distinction there between public safety and amenity and public safety work related. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And you would have read the evidence that Ms White gave about that in your review of the transcript from yesterday? Yes. It's the second of those I want to ask you about. Are we to understand the reference work related in brackets there to be synonymous with the extent of the responsibility for public safety under Section 23 of the OHS Act? That's correct. So we, we understand work-related means As a arising from the, the conduct of the undertaking. Yes. Um, you could see how one might take a different view, that something could be work-related, but not... Work-related is a very gen, general, general expression. Term, yes. Arising from the conduct of the undertaking is, is, a, is a bit of legalese, if there ever was an example of one, isn't there? Would you agree with that? No, I, I understand the term con conduct of the undertaking and, okay. and, it's, and it's intent. It's not, I don't think it's just legalese. Anyway, you, you say we, we and anyone else should read that as being tied to the Section 23 responsibility. Right. So I wasn't present when this schedule was drafted. I understand um, that. But I imagine when, when you're trying to work out the overlaps between a, a mine licensing mine regulator and the Occupational Health and Safety Regulator, that when it re refers to public safety brackets work-related, it's referring to public safety as a result of Occupational Health and Safety Law. Because the, as a lead agency, the VWA only applies the Occupational Health and Safety Law. We don't apply any of the other regulations that apply to mines. Now, if I can take you back to your statement, please, at paragraph 21. Sorry, Mr Rosen, before you go there, um, Mr Neist, your answer to the very complicated discussion I'm still trying to get my head around, the major mine fire, um, Mr Rosen asked you what was the source documents and you referred to the safety management system and the safety assessment and the regulations. Is that right? That's correct, sir. So the safety assessment kicks in if it's a major mining hazard. Yeah, no. Uh, um, but if it's just a mining hazard, this, it has to be covered by the safety management system. OK, now, um, Ms Doyle was um, describing some of the documentation and we have this folder that was produced to us this morning. So just for clarification, can you tell me what the safety management system source document is? It's a defined document. So it has, it's a document that has to be... A safety management system is in concept, but it also has to be documented. So the duty holder has to be able to present a safety management system that calls out any number of elements, but it has the, can be from 13 to 23 in a safety management system. But the elements of the safety management system are defined by the duty holder as representing the specific focuses of risk management and the risk controls that they'll put in place to manage those risks. So, Mr Rosen, you might be able to help me. Have we been presented with that document, the safety management system? Um, a document has been provided to the inquiry under cover of the letter that's been exhibited 2nd of May 2009. And... The letter advises... Lead anyone. The uh, request specifically said 
draw the inquiry's attention to the safety management system, and I'm just trying to see um, a page six of the letter under the heading Occupational Health and Safety. Um, it advises Hazelwood, as a reference to GDF sewers, has established and implemented a safety management system for the mine in accordance with 5.3.21 of the regulations. Mine fire is one of the mining hazards managed under the system. And then there's a reference to tab 26, which is a document we had earlier. Um, but I think there is also another document in the folder, which I just can't immediately get my, can't see. Ms Doyle might be able to assist us. That is entitled safety management system. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll have to have a look. It was eight volumes. I'll have a look. We'll clarify that. I, I'm from memory, and I haven't got that particular folder with me in the hearing room, but I think there is a document entitled Safety Management System. And Mr Neist, nice, it's your evidence that there is a document that you've referred to or sourced that's called the Safety Management System? It's a requirement of prescribed mind to have a safety management system. And the safety assessment is the document that we talked about before, the bow tie diagram with those control... A bow tie is a graphical representation yes. of a safety assessment. Thank you, Mr. Rosen. Thank you. Um, just, I, I neglected to ask you a moment ago about this question of, of uh, foreseeability of the events of February and March of this year. Um, as I understand your evidence, you say it was never foreseen by the operator of the mine that that event could occur in the way that it ultimately did. And the basis of that is from your examination of their documentation of risk. You don't say that it wasn't foreseeable, do you? If you understand the distinction? Correct. I, I agree. Do you agree that it was foreseeable? It's, it's a foreseeable outcome of a fire in an open-cut brown coal mine. Yes. Smoke, smoke and ash. Um, to, to the extent that was experienced um, and based on the previous fires that had occurred into that mine was probably judged to be extremely low likelihood or not even considered as a, as a consequence that they'd put their thoughts to. I mean, you're aware that there have been previous fires in the worked out batters of this particular mine, two yes. in fact in the last decade? Yes, I am. Um, you're also aware that a fire in an open coal mine being caused by an external bushfire is not an unprecedented event. We know it happened in Yalorn in 1944. Yes. Um, and you're also aware, I take it, of the evidence we've heard about the particular difficulties associated with putting out brown coal mine fires. Yes. And those particular difficulties will be exacerbated if the fire is located in a place where it's difficult to access where there's a lack of water and the like. Yes. Um, putting all that together, that would <coughs> seem to suggest that something like what happened in February and March of this year uh, was foreseeable, if not specifically foreseen. Do you agree with that? I agree that the fire was foreseeable. Yes. Um, I don't know if the, the duty holder or, or even the, the industry had foreseen that it would get to the extent that it got to and result in the impact on more well that it had. I, that's the bit of... I'm not saying the fire was unforeseeable. It was definitely foreseeable. And I'm not saying that the that it's not foreseeable that if it's a brown coal fire that it's going to create smoke and ash. But it's the extent of this particular event that I'm saying wasn't documented anywhere that I can find that it was foreseen that that was a, something that someone was trying to control or correct. understand that. I should have added one last piece of that, um, of the evidence we've heard, and that is that um, it took several hours, I won't be specific, it took several hours for the CFA to be on the scene actively trying to put out the fire. Um, and once again, you'd agree, wouldn't you, that on a very high fire danger day, it's foreseeable that the CFA might not have sufficient resources to address a mine fire? Definitely. On the, on the circumstances, they have to send their resources to the highest risk, as, as we do in addressing WorkSafe yep. issues. Um, now, can I... Uh, I was about to move to a new topic, but I see the time. It might be appropriate yes. to break. Yes.